It's time for Windows Weekly. Richard Campbell's here, Paul Therott's here, and we will be talking about Windows 11 and a new Widgets UI coming in the uh, Canary version. Teams 2.0 has some complete rewrite and some very interesting features and uh, a complete rundown of how brown liquor is distilled. Yes, it's the distillation chapter of our introduction to whiskey with Richard Campbell. All coming up next on Windows Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott and Richard Campbell. Episode 822, recorded Wednesday, March 29th, 2023. Squirt a little fresh air. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Lookout. Whether on a device or in the cloud, your business data is always on the move. Minimize risk, increase visibility, and ensure compliance with Lookout's unified platform. Visit Lookout.com today. And by Collide. Collide is a device trust solution that ensures if a device isn't secure, it can't access your apps. It's zero trust for Okta. Visit collide.com slash WW and book a demo today. And by ACI Learning. If you love IT Pro, you'll love ACI Learning. ACI Learning offers fully customizable training for your team in formats for all types of learners across audit, cybersecurity, and IT. From entry-level training to putting people on the moon, ACI Learning has you covered. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit to learn more. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show we cover the latest news from Microsoft with Mr. Richard Campbell from Runners Radio and .NET Rocks. Hello, Richard. Hello, friend. Up at the lake house, except your, yours is on no, a lake. No. Yeah, I'm st I'm still in the city. Oh, you're still in the city. Yeah, yeah. What kind of Canadian are you? Um, it's practically patio weather. It is very nice up here right mm. now. Admittedly, Jealous. but uh, yeah, I haven't made it to the coast quite yet. And yeah, not a lake. It's an ocean. It's full of critters. Coast house. That sure would is. that would work. Yeah. Oh, the coast speaking place, of critters, pretty sure I saw eagles mating there one time. It was yeah. awkward. Yeah. Paul Therott, now with uh, new molding. Joining us from uh, his place in, uh, are you still? Does Actually, it, I, I, is it Upper I'm now McCungie in Mukunji. Mukunji proper. Just regular Mukunji. Everyday oh. Mukunji. Okay. I'm literally on the other side of the tracks, Leo. Nice. Wow. They, it, it gives you, and it gives you a molding upgrade. How about that? Just moving on up. <laughs> well, I don't know an upgrade, but it gave me a molding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got to write in Mukunji PA. So you're both home. That's kind of nice. Yep. It's very it's nice. It's kind of nice. Yep. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we could just jump right into this. Uh, distillation later, I've been informed. Get yes. ready. Richard yep. got up in the middle of the night, so uh, you know it's a tome. It's an epic. I, I'm having fun with it. Yeah, I love it. I think we could release these as a separate uh, show entirely. Thank you. I've been telling him this. you got to do this as a series. I don't, yeah. yeah, okay. Or something. I don't know what you call this. It's a video series, a podcast, a, a book. <laughs> do we something. need, I was wondering, I was thinking this morning, do we need to say, you know, the, uh, you know, Liquor Council of America reminds you to drink, drink responsibly? Or are we just... Um, we could just say I'll remind you to drink responsibly. Okay. These are, you know, I I generally recommend sipping whiskeys. Like, have one, yeah. Then yeah. put it, then yeah, put it, it away. Um, I've never seen Richard get like plastered or anything. Hmm. Yeah, then put it I away. Think. That's good. I like yeah. it. Just have one. Let's have one. Yeah. The podcasters of America remind you. Just listen to one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In all things, <laughs> don't attempt Richard. to double up. Yeah. Yeah. The more you know. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Any Windows 12 news we should lead off with? Nope. No. I good. appreciate the fact that the rest of the world is reporting what I said two months ago, but, you know, whatever. That's good. <laughs> Finally catching up. <laughs> Paul, little Pauly Thoreau. No, I, Somehow he knows. No, I, uh, I made the supposition. Remember that uh, Windows 12 would be the AI release. Yeah, well, and, now I think uh, Actually, safe. the big supposition I made was not that actually and that was that's pretty much a fact but rather i kind of came i just talked myself into this uh, that windows 12 would either require or would work better 
with an NPU based PC, right? A, a neural processor. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. You did say that. Yep. Starting to look good. Starting to look good. Yeah, Starting I'm definitely in the market for a new laptop, and I'll mm -hmm. be looking out for that neural processor. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Wowie zowie. Yeah. You know, you could do yourself a lot of good right now if you wanted it pretty quickly. And I'd have to look. I don't remember the exact chipset, but AMD announced a chipset at uh, CES that their new PCs are coming out any day now that supports NPU. Nice. Um, and that would solve a bunch of problems, <laughs> right? Because there's other stuff going on with Intel that isn't necessarily great right well, now. Well, you know, if they uh, make it the AI uh, version of Windows, they could pause it for six months and uh, <laughs> that'll give them some time. Sure. Yeah. I, I just don't know that time's actually going to help them at this particular moment. <laughs> I, I know. think they, they need data. And they're and just like just like auto drive on a Tesla, we're being tested on in you public. It's like, oh, uh, hey, we have flying thing. cars. You know what? Let's take a pause on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you just can't do it. Yeah. You can't. No, it's not going to happen. In fact, it's almost self-serving. I, You know, there's a certain conspiracy-minded person who might say yeah. that the uh, entire petition to pause is really just an ad for how close to AGI we really are. And, yeah. uh, oh, golly, golly, right. golly, you don't want that? Let's pause. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And it's really just an I mean, ad we've for all seen AI. Terminator, right? Yeah. You know, we, we know how this ends. It's going to be well, fun. And, and I, let me go on record as we're nowhere near AGI. No, I think like, not even vaguely I think close. Yeah, it's not a thing. Take, take, take your time. This is the scene where it flashes forward in the movie and it says six months later. And then it's like this hellscape where robots <laughs> Hello, are stepping Hello, I themselves. am Richard Campbell. <laughs> and, the then, and the iPhone's going to amount to nothing. With your, your opinion. <laughs> it is a risky thing to predict anything in this business. That's for sure. Sure. I can predict new Windows 11 features, however. Oh, boy. All right. So actually, this is surprisingly interesting Weird. in our little world. Um, you rem you may remember a couple of things, a couple of things that kind of preface this. On February 28th, which was two weeks before Patch Tuesday, Microsoft released a preview version of Moment 2, right? Right. It's a really weird timing. It's um, Microsoft doesn't really talk about week D that much, right? Mm -hmm. But we typically have a week A, B, and C in every month where updates can happen, different types of updates. Uh, week B, which is the second Tuesday of the month, is... Uh, Patch Tuesday, we all know about that. Uh, but February twenty eighth was week D, so it's like kind of a kind of a weird time frame, right? So two weeks later, they ship the stable version of that patch uh, as part of Patch Tuesday, and uh, now we flash forward two more weeks. And this past Tuesday, Microsoft released another preview update for something that will come out in uh, April's. So that's patch two Tuesday. D's in a row. Two D's in a row. Mm. Um, not in the announcement post, but rather in a separate. No, um, actually, let me step back. I'm sorry. In the announcement post for this cumulative update, they mentioned those features I talked about last week, uh, three of the four of them that were in the release preview. And I alleged that these things hadn't been broadly tested in the Insider program. They just made their way into the release preview program. Since then, uh, someone reached out to me and said at least one of them, maybe two of them, actually had been in the dev channel at one point, uh, but they didn't follow the normal path to release. So they're, they're minor features. It's not a huge deal, but I... I sort of, I, I think I made the comment that they'll appear in some fashion over the next couple of months. I didn't think they were going to wait for like a moment three type update, but I, you know, just based on the fact that they had come into the release preview program. So they, they appeared in a preview cumulative update yesterday. If you have Windows 11 22 H2, you can go get it. You have to manually download it to get it. Um, there's nothing to look forward to. It's not particularly interesting, but uh, there are three, I guess it's three new features, not four. And okay. But separately, Microsoft had a blog post, and they had it. They hit it in their tech community blog to make sure no one read it. That explained that they are in fact going to be doing preview releases not every single month, but most months on week D. And they said it was kind of perfect timing because it's two weeks after Patch Tuesday, and two weeks before the next Patch Tuesday. So if you want to test something before it comes out in, on Patch Tuesday, uh, this would be the way. Now, uh, this isn't the first time this has come up, but you know we in the Windows world, have this notion of feature updates. I'll call that like capital F feature updates. These are version upgrades. This is the Windows 11 version 22H2, the coming 23H2, that kind of thing. Um, there are also like small F feature updates that are 
um, like moments, right? The moment one and moment two updates where uh, Microsoft considers these to be major small M updates that have multiple new features that are not part of capital F feature updates. But now we also have these updates that deliver features, right? Which are just cumulative updates that also include security fixes, and bug fixes, and uh, they're kind of minor. And they're not, so they're not feature updates, capital F. They're not moment updates. They're, you know, and this is that whole thing. Like, hey, we're only doing one feature update a year. Just kidding. Are they kind of like faster. update yeah. snacks? <laughs> yes. There you go. Yeah. Or is this really a testing ground for getting to those major build versions twice a year? I, this is it does feel like they're trying to modernize the the yeah. insider update process i feel so my i mean we can only speculate they don't really talk about this too much but back in 2015 i think january 2015 probably uh terry myerson i think first brought up the term windows as a service right we're going to upgrade windows as if it were a service you know here's this uh, kind of monolithic legacy software platform. We're going to pretend it's an online service. It's something we can update all the time. And there were lots and lots of problems. We talked about this incessantly sure. on the podcast over the years. Every time a feature update, capital F feature update came out, something would break, you know, Kindles were crashing PCs, whatever it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, um, and I, not on the dev side, that was a problem too, because often they were doing UX updates mm -hmm. and you had to get your IT guy to put those in if you wanted to use them in your apps for UWP. Like, right, right, exactly. Yeah, was, that's it was not a good of, thing. Yeah, right, another can of worms where, yes, you had to be on a very specific version of Windows 10 at the time to get new UWP uh, features. It was, the whole thing was a mess. So mm -hmm. I, I guess, you know, flash forward, what is it, 20, we're talking eight years later, um, I mean, I hate to, I almost hate to admit this in a way, but because there are always going to be problems here and there, but I feel like that after that many years, maybe they've sort of figured it out, mm. you know, I, mean, you're, I think you're referencing the Chris Morrissey blog post. Cause he also says continuous innovation for windows. 11. Yes. Which is that groan inducing term that Panos Panay always carts out, um, mm. which hey, is, we, yeah, we use that term in dev all the time, but we're not updating your operating system. Yeah, it's like I'm doing a get. You know, they're doing a get push to everyone's computer at once. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's like, what are you doing? Well, but, admittedly, in the insiders, right? Like, well, but no, they're doing in stable too. That's my point. I mean, because yeah. that's, uh, you know, since Windows 11 version 22 H2 came out, there was there were two moment releases, mm -hmm. and now there is a another thing. I don't know. It's not a moment, <laughs> but they are they are kind of optional, right? Like it doesn't install automatically. You can choose in in update to install it. You can choose to update the preview version, but when it when the March, I'm sorry, when the April version happens in two weeks, it's mandatory, right? Yeah. Now that doesn't mean it's going to just happen overnight. I mean, the, the the normal process still applies, but if you check for updates, you're going to get it. You know, that's there's no there's no avoiding it. Um. Look, we've complained enough about some of the issues over the past just six months to, to know it's not perfect, right? The I think the actually the search pill is another example of the type mm -hmm. of update we're about to see, right? That's a, a non-moment update. Um, but it, that felt very much like an experiment. Yes, it did. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, it was corrected eventually. But um, I, I, I believe the real experiment was that there was, can we get away with this? You know, yeah. we'll, we'll make this one semi-minor well, UI And except change. for that one noisy writer online. Yeah, Pretty except for that one did. idiot that that, one on the podcast who can't shut up. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't even use the feature. But for want of a couple of screenshots, just a couple of screenshots, yeah, 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 everything exactly. would have been fine. Right. Did, he, did he publish the book? Yeah, change it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's one thing. But I mean, look, it, it they lost functionality. It was a regression yeah. too. I mean, they they oh, lost. You the mean Windows up. 11? Did you say that out loud? I don't think you meant to say that out loud. <laughs> the re Windows 11, the regression release. Yeah. Anyway, so um, here's the real I, question: I, Yeah, have they fixed the Acropolis? <laughs> yes, they have. Okay. Yes, although I, that's a. a, a a horrible uh, word for something so minor, right? <laughs> is it, Th is it minor? On... Is it minor? Let me just tell you a little story. Let me no, tell no, you I'm a sorry, tale. On Windows, Leo. No, no, I mean on Windows. It's not on minor. the uh, iPhone? No, on the iPhone it's not. On Android, it's uh, it's a pixel thing. Yeah. But, but on right. Windows, yeah. I mean, the idea was the snipping tool, if you crop, still retains the, uh, the cropped right. parts of the image, right? Yep. Let me tell you why that's not minor. Let me tell you about a... <laughs> A young lady used to work for Tech TV. Uh -oh. Okay. <laughs> she uh, she had a little personal photo shoot, brought a photographer and got some great pictures. Some of them were, you mm -hmm. know, a little grown up. 
Uh, not all okay. of them, but one of them, she had a great expression on her face, and she thought, this should be my headshot, my avatar. This should be what I use uh, going forward. Cropped it down, put it out. Uh, even then, this is a 20-year-old flaw. I don't think mm -hmm. it was in Windows. I think it was in Photoshop. Uh, yeah. Somebody discovered that, like, my goodness, the rest of her is still there. Yeah, you could like control Z it back to where it was. Yeah, and um, so to much embarrassment, I might add, on her part. Oh no! So I, okay, so yeah, I uh, still she, think that this she is had a, released this topless is, photos I mean by of herself unwittingly, basically. Yeah, that, you don't do that with a screenshot tool, though. <laughs> what I'm saying is, I guess you wouldn't. You're right. I mean, you would do I, it with what, Photoshop. what I meant by minor is, um, from a usage perspective, most people who are taking screenshots in Windows are yeah. probably taking screenshots in Windows. They're not yeah. taking. I mean, it could be a video capture or something. Absolutely. I mean, I know that. I, I don't mean to say that there aren't instances where this could be bad for someone individually. What I mean is, broadly speaking. Broadly speaking was exactly the problem. No, but <laughs> <laughs> broadly speaking on Windows, oh, it's not a big sorry. deal. I do agree on a mobile phone yeah. where people tend to take what you personal would use. pictures yeah. and send them to loved yeah. ones and whatever. Mm -hmm. But yes, that could be a bigger problem. Um, Microsoft did fix it immediately, though. They did fix it very yes, quickly. Yes. Yeah. They, they consider by the it sufficiently way, that, concerning. If you want to be pro-Microsoft about this event, you could say this proves the rationale for making that kind of a tool, something that's updated through the store and not part of Windows. It yeah. doesn't have to wait for some release. You get it automatically. You don't do anything to get it. It just happens. The system works, right? I mean, The system you know, works. It, this is something that's um, what they said all when Silicon Valley Bank done. collapsed. The system mm. works. <laughs> Well, I mean, not the crypto system, but the, you know, the normal banking system normal is banking probably system okay. Works. Yeah. Um, you, I see this. I, I switched back to Pixel recently. I see, you know, you look at what's being updated. You see things that are apps. You see things that are kind of like system things, but they're updated to the Play Store. Um, Apple does this on uh, iOS and, and Mac and wherever else. I mean, it, it, we've broken these things up in such ways that different pieces of the system can be updated in different ways. So anyway, that it, it's... You know, not so long ago, a problem with like what people think of as screenshots, which is like a system capability, right? It'd be hard uh, to would fix. Require a Windows yeah. update of some kind, which means yeah. people could avoid it. You know, yeah. and these days that happens through an app, and now you can just slip you know, it right in. Yeah, no one even yep. notices. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. Yeah, and that's nice because there are probably very few instances of anyone on Windows being harmed by this, if any, and now there won't be. Right, that's it's nice. That's yeah. what I mean. That's what I mean. That's fair. Yeah. I'm just I just like the name Acropolis. That's all. It's good. See, I, you know, I'm I'm usually a fan of names like that. It's just so overblown in this case. It's like the it isn't exactly an you know? apocalypse. It's uh, it's, it's just you like know. yeah, you know, all these people taking you know screen grabs with uh, the snipping tool, <laughs> the billions but, of but, people. But Microsoft that. does want you to use that, right? I mean, they made a big deal. Yeah, of, yeah. No, or yeah. At least Panos sure. Panay made a big deal about it. Sure. Sure. I uh, can't wait to see those topless shots of Panos but Panay. Yeah, sure. that'll be that'll be something to look forward to. Uh, Canary. Yeah. So so they did. So now the, it, uh, the alpha it's alpha beta gamma is now what release alpha beta gamma release beta so it's canary. Kind, they've added a canary channel, which is akin to what you know the daily. Well, Chrome they started that, daily, think, but you know right? web Chrome browsers is a, can, a daily yeah. canary yeah. channel, right? Um, my theory on that one, and you know, just a theory, is that's Windows 12, right? That's where they're going to test Windows 12 stuff. And it's um, a it's a daily build. No, it's not. That's I, I, as I said that I'm like actually there the are Windows there are dailies. Daily. You, Canary tends to be daily in web browsers. So yeah. It's not. Yeah, it's not daily. Yeah. I'm sure it's daily internal at Microsoft, but no, not. not yeah, for and and, they, and they're using the Canary term as in Canary in the coal mine. Is it? I think it dies are. first. I think they right. are. Yep. Either I guess that. they could have called it Kenny, but that Kenny, would have <laughs> Kenny would be either. good. Yeah. Microsoft like Windows it. Kenny, I like it. Yeah. Yep. You oh killed, God, Kenny. killed Kenny. <laughs> yep. Just like, yeah, use an orange hood as the symbol. That's it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think that's where the, I think this is where we're going to start seeing some Windows 12 stuff, right? It doesn't mean that ex you know exclusively. So for example, the new Canary build this past week has uh, what I would call an evolved UX uh, for the widget board. Um. Could that appear in Windows 11 before there's a Windows 12? Obviously, right? I mean, I think right now, I, I this is another step in the, you know, in whatever gets released to people at some somewhere down the road. But I think someday we're going to start seeing 
stuff that is going to hold off until Windows 12. So nothing, nothing major here. I mean, most people I would imagine ignore or turn off widgets right now. Um, but we saw in, I think, actually, I think it was in moment two, they added the full screen widget, you know, UI. Um, if you want to use the floating pane, it currently it's two columns. It's going to be three columns, you know, exciting. Uh, and then some stuff we're starting to see actually elsewhere in the, um, inside a program like the USB four settings page, for example, is not unique to Canary. We've seen it elsewhere. So that's almost certainly going to appear in windows 11 before there's a windows 12. So nothing, nothing huge going on here, but you know, maybe someday. Uh, okay. Let's, All right. I'm done uh, defending Microsoft now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, before you get into this, uh, cause yes. I liked your, I liked your rant. Unfortunately, you have to be a, not unfortunately, fortunately, you have to be a Thorop mm -hmm. Premium member to read this. Mm -hmm. But did you hear uh, Steve Gibson's rant from yesterday? I did not. Talk to me. Ah. Because mm -hmm. uh, this segues nicely into your rant. Okay. okay. Um, and I thought I would like to get Richard's uh, take on it. So apparently Microsoft has decided if you're using an older, unsupported version of Exchange, <laughs> the email you send from it will no longer be... <laughs> accepted by microsoft properties like outlook like it just will say you know you're you know if you're you know maybe you uh, richard were running an outdated version of exchange i know you never would uh mm. and uh <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> family members decided to use it to send mail that mail would be rejected at all uh, microsoft uh hosted mail sites and steve was a little offended by that saying basically well you've broken you know you you've broken email for the you know plainly venal purposes of making money of getting people to update your thoughts well, i mean the ar the argument is that there have been several major breaches oh god exchange old exchange servers yeah yes even not old exchange servers yeah but uh, uh the, is the mail sent by such servers uh dangerous well in, with those breaches comes bce types attacks like that there, therein lies the problem. Like they, that Haftium exploit was an end-to-end -end exploit of of Exchange, and while the current versions of Exchange server got patches to protect against Haftium, the old ones don't. Like all those small business server additions that people may still be running, they're not. There are no patches for that. Like you're basically in, you know, the opposite. The alternative to uh, this is saying patch every version of Exchange at the beginning of time. Well, what what's the cutoff for this uh, exchange version thing? Uh, what's the issue? Like, what we're well, talking two thousand three and older, two thousand seven and older. Uh, Twenty thirteen goes out of patch like in the next month. I see. It's ten years. Yeah. So, I mean, therein lies the problem: is there's plenty of exchange servers floating around out there, and so how do you? And they were the ones that didn't get patched in the first place. Right. Right. This is like, this is an unsolvable problem. You either support these products for ten years or you don't. Right. Mm -hmm. But then you run into exceptions where there's some huge percentage of companies in this case out in the world running this thing or some government comes to you. This happened with um, Windows XP, which had long been out of support. Yeah. And the UK government came to Microsoft and said, look, our hospitals are all being held for ransomware. You got to help us fix this. Yeah. And as Terry Myerson said at the time, what am I going to do? Not fix this problem? Yeah. I mean, we get it. It's out of support. But, uh, you know, so sometimes what? you have to do the right thing. Right. Yeah. Um, it, this is a hard one. Um, this is, but this is a, a series of dramatic breaches. They're going yeah. to continue. It's a vehicle for propagating hacks. And so, you know, the idea so that they, they would Microsoft fly this. have a free upgrade they could offer companies to fix this problem? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> an interesting point. Like, it, at least bundle this with a discount for show yeah, us your entire right? old server. We give you a year of exchange mm -hmm. online. Exactly. Right. Like, at least sweeten the pot a little. I mean, I, yep. I, I get the problem because I've lived it, right? Like my server was got swept by the Hafnium hack. It didn't get breached for some configuration reasons, but that's <laughs> just dumb luck on my part. Right. Like, and and that you in the end they mostly fixed Hafnium by by exploiting the breach to patch them. <laughs> Richard, you'll probably remember this. What was the it was an IIS slash SQL attack from a million years ago where Code Red. Your your home well, your it was your homepage was replaced with you've been hacked by the Chinese. 
Do you remember that one? That yeah. was so I got it. I, I was yeah. hit by that. Oh, you got it. But, nice. But I wasn't really because it only worked if your WW root was folder was in the default location. Oh, right. But I always moved mine to a different drive. So in my default location, there was an HTML file that, you know, default.htm or whatever that said, you've been hacked by the Chinese. And like, no, I haven't. It didn't get yeah. loaded. You know, because, yeah. Yeah. because I was lucky, right? Yeah. That was the only reason. Same thing. My internal name and my external name from my mail servers are different. And the system go. wasn't set up for that. And so it got all the way in, but then didn't know yep. the name of the server and couldn't continue. Okay. It is better to be lucky than good. I think we've come to this yes. conclusion. <laughs> there it's it's some, good to be both. It would be nice to be uh, both, but if you had yeah. to choose... I mean, that being <laughs> yep. said, it doesn't stop me from putting Tony Redman on Run As Radio to rant thoroughly about this. Like, <laughs> that will be a good half hour. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think Steve, he's an old timer, and his position really is that email should be sacrosanct. And if you've got a problem with, you know, buggy servers, which are your fault that you don't want to patch, which is your fault, you shouldn't punish, you shouldn't break email as a way of, you know, letting people know. That this, got buggy you, servers. this couldn't be a better segue into what I wanted to talk about then, because this is perfect. That's why mm -hmm. I brought it up. This is perfect. Tell me, Paul. The, so a couple of weeks ago, if you subscribe to Microsoft 365 Family or um, Personal, you probably saw a Windows Defender icon appear in your start menu. You thought, what the heck is this stupid thing? <laughs> I, already have some, I already have security on my computer. It's built in. Microsoft is do, going down a path that they went down 20, 25 years ago, which is they're, 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 res, they're responsible for insecurities in Windows, and now they're charging you to fix those problems <laughs> through a security project. It's a win-win, Paul. <laughs> See, I would say for the user, that's a lose-lose. Lose-lose. <laughs> but well, you know, it's a zero-sum zero game, you know. Now, this one uh, didn't impact me too too much because, I mean, I'm paying for this service anyway. I, I didn't pay for it for Windows Defender. I pay for it for OneDrive storage and for the desktop office apps and all that kind of stuff. But I've always had a problem with this, and I had a problem with it back in the day. You know, I don't remember the exact time frame in this early 2000s. Microsoft uh, released a product called OneCare, Windows Live OneCare. It was a monthly or annual subscription service where they would fix the problems, the security and uh, the security problems of Windows. Now, the argument at the time, and, and now the argument today, because I've heard from a guy who worked in that team at Microsoft who's very upset with me for having this opinion, is that, uh, well, there are these third-party companies, McAfee and Norton, et cetera, who are stroking users for monthly or annual subscriptions that they, you know, that are more expensive than what Microsoft was charging. And I said, yeah, but Microsoft created that industry. See, if you just secured Windows from the get-go, they would not be necessary. And the other thing I would just point out is that whatever you think of those companies, I think they're worthless, personal, personally, but uh, they do, uh, they have expanded their offerings to include other types of services related to privacy and security and whatnot. And so there's a whole suite of functionality there. If, if you feel safer or want that kind of stuff, I mean, God love you, but um, they have kind of changed with the times. Um, the reason I wrote something recently about this, not this specific topic I just mentioned, but this topic of Microsoft and their business practices and their behavior in general is that they apparently have not changed over time because the Microsoft I knew and loved when I was coming up as a younger guy, this belligerent monopolist from the 1990s that was destroying companies and lives left and right, kind of transitioned into a post-antitrust saccharine sweet Satya Nadella era thing where we love open source and Linux is no longer a cancer and everything's great and let's all ring around the rose not ring around the rose that's a terrible song but let's run around in a circle with flowers in our hair and, 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 and in nice fact is uh, is yeah. tied to the uh, the the black plague of uh, 16 yes. yeah exactly that's why yeah. that's you're why, thinking yeah, more why. kumbaya not yeah, popping yeah, up I, your I, lights I, yeah. right. I, I, I try to stop ashes that one ashes so, we all <laughs> fall down fall down yeah it turned it into like a Freddy Krueger movie there but anyway um <laughs> It is amazing to me, in a kind of, it's like riding a bike kind of a way, that Microsoft could now, especially during the Satya Nadella era, kind of turn back to their old way of doing things, right? This is the company that created teams to destroy Slack that had to be bought by Salesforce to buy, you know, that is now suing them. This is the company that is currently um, uh, actually in negotiations to settle with uh, cloud companies from Europe, which maybe Richard ties into what you're going to talk to at the end of the show or not. I'm not sure, but um, Microsoft is currently under investigation in the EU for uh, unfairly taking on these cloud, uh, like kind of third-party cloud vendors in, in Europe. Um, 
This is the company that forces you to use the Edge web browser, even when you've specifically told it through its obtuse and useless user interface in Windows 11 that I want to use Chrome or Brave or Firefox or whatever it is that you chose to use. You know, this is the company that continuously advertises uh, products and services inside of its products and services, even though I'm not paying. I'm already paying for those products and services. How I, do you not I know I saw that? Your, uh, your tweet, I think it was. Maybe it was on Mastodon. I'm hoping. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of the, he's saying, oh, would you please? I, what do I need to do to get you? Yeah, to stop yeah well, I'll, I'm on. begging you, stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm sure your AI is perfect. How come this simpler thing is stupid? <laughs> like, what, what, what? I, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. We don't anyway, need braids now. I, I we am, have AI. Yeah, I think maybe there's a case. You know, this AI pause. Maybe there's a case that we shouldn't let AI get any smarter. It's just making us dumber. Mm. Oh, AI, will AI is not that this smart is, in the first place. Yeah, that's like, true. It's, so, it's, all right. This it's artificial is the, dumbness. You, you know, we're on the porch, you, kid, you know, kids these days argument, of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we live in, I, I've already been uh, uh, upset with myself needing to use Google Maps to get anywhere in a car. Like, I can't I like drive anymore. That I You're right. Way around. right. You're right. I have no um, idea. Th there are so many examples of this dumbening. It's that would just, be a it's, good, oh my uh, God, we speak in emojis now. I mean, people say lol. Good new video game to give people... One of those uh, Thompson guides and say, can you find your way across town? Yeah. Well, you know, just figure out where you are. Yeah. Where yes. are you? This, but this does <laughs> feel like old man shakes fist at cloud. Right? Well, like, that's our, the, welcome to the show, uh, Richard. Yeah. Glad you've discovered you, it. You don't need to grow your own food. You don't need to make your own electricity. <laughs> is, okay, no, no. Like, yeah. For a hundred percent. When, when cars first came out, you had to be a qualified mechanic to even own such a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, even qualified mechanics can't repair them because no. they're computers. Yeah, you you, know? you, you plug into it and ask it how it feels, right? Right, like that's... right. No, I, listen, I recognize that part of the argument. I, believe me, I, I, I do get that. But I, anyway, just bring it back to Microsoft. Um, I think I, I'll, this... I'll grab the point that I like the most from that whole rant, Paul, which is okay. any time a, a piece of equipment that I have purchased interrupts me yes. to try and encourage me to purchase yes. something else or to, uh, you know, yeah. to put its priorities ahead of my own, yeah. it that's, is wrong. That's the insurtification. That's that the insurtification. Yeah. God bless Corey yep. Doctorow yeah. for coming Eating up. Eating your term. seed corn. I thanked him for it. He was on it is Twitter on per, Sunday. It's perfect. I said we, we, Every we, time I have a Teams meeting and I'm talking to someone live on video and it pops something up in the blocks the video <laughs> and says, hey, <laughs> Paul, did you know? You could be sharing an Excel spreadsheet right now. Yeah. If like said, hey, did you know? Because it's you. You should know. I'm in a meeting, you freaking <laughs> idiot. And why are you interrupting me? I mean, it's it's crazy. So anyway, I yes, I I'm increasingly I, Microsoft is so under the radar right now. They are mm. such an Oldsmobile from a kind of a brand perspective that I feel like they're getting away with stuff that they might not have otherwise. Were it not for the fact that antitrust regulators right now are a little busy yeah. with Google. But then and, the Bing and, AI and, thing came along. Like, that's what was weird. This seemed to yes. be a game that had been playing for a decade. Yep. Of kind of staying under the radar, being number two, yes. you know, staying out of trouble with all of that. And then suddenly it's not that way anymore, right? No. Like, they, they, they do this thing in first place. The thing is, I, I, I the only thing I have, I mean, I'm not... I, I don't want to take, I don't want to say this the wrong way. I don't mean I want Microsoft to fail. I, I really, I don't mean it like that. But Microsoft does not have a good history of being first with anything. No tech company does. <laughs> okay. They all um, suck at it. Yeah. They're used to chasing. That's what they know. And the moment they aren't, they're kind of lost. Yeah. Right, right. So this is, them coming out of the gate first with this stuff is very interesting. They have clearly opened a Pandora's box of competition uh, from all quarters, big and small. And, you know, we'll see how it all, you know, falls out. But, you know, we saw little bits of this, you know, the pandemic happened and everything was free. And then the pandemic ended and all, now we have Teams Room Pro and we have um, Teams Pro. <laughs> and, and we, you know, all of a sudden everything's like extra. And it's like, I'm sorry, you're charging me for things that were free before now? What, what is happening here? Um, this is when you kind of realize what this company is all about. And by the way, I, I, I have all my uh, all these theories. I've talked about my theories about Windows 12 and AI and, and MPUs and everything. I have a theory that the reason they did this right now is that they could see that they were going to have a, a lean several quarters 
post pandemic kind of fall apart type of thing. And they said, how can we bump the stock price and the revenues? And they were like, unleash the AI hounds, baby. This will, this will make the post pandemic malaise go away. Well, I get the giggles that, like, when you speak of Microsoft as a uniform entity of any I, kind. Yes, thank right? you. Like, that's, that's not e absolutely. not even close. Ab well, absolutely I, fair. I, but there I, is I like a, the the chat. The chat GPT ends up with a hundred million users in two months, yes. and the Bing team goes, "Hey, yep. wait yep. a second. We right? never got that ever, not once. Yeah. Right. So this dynamic yep. between the different teams competing with each other there and pressing against each other, the politics of all of that creates this belligerency yeah. like it's so much harder to have a you know agency over this giant beast but the you know, far it, more likely it, thing you, is you have individual so competitive groups you made the absolutely correct point that microsoft is not this giant jellyfish organization where everything moves together absolutely true but microsoft is also an organ a giant organization of upward mobility types and they know that if they're not they don't see ai on everything they're not going anywhere Right. And that's why everything is going to be AI now at Microsoft, right? Yes. They, this is just you like don't have it was, to tell them. I bet Sachin Nadella did tell them, but you yeah. don't have to. Anyone who's anyone is going to AI the hell out of any, everything they're doing. Um, and it, it just, it's it's the path to promotion, right? Like this is individuals make, taking an opportunity, the same yeah. as as they ActiveX to everything. And they Azured everything, and they dot netted everything. Like, yeah, but this is—I mean, yes, but this time, I don't remember. I don't. I don't want well, to misquote this. I don't know if it was Jeffrey Fowler from the Washington Post, or if this maybe it was a an editorial in the New York Times. So somebody pointed out this is a month ago. Microsoft has these AI ethics guidelines. There are seven of them, mm. and uh, Bing Chat broke six of them. Right, and the team <laughs> got let go. And it's like you've got to be kidding me. Like, yeah. So that something, you know, I don't know if someone backed into the spigot, but whatever happened, it opened. And and now we're just throwing caution to the wind, you know? Yeah, for and, now. You know, the this, yeah. there's one group of the, the fast movers are the fast movers. The, you know, the, the legal and the concerned folks are a little bit slower moving. Like, and this is a hype cycle. Right. Right. Let's not forget. Uh, you know, the next comes the trough of disillusionment. But, you know, Make but, sure you know what fuck side <laughs> you are on sure. as you head into the trough. <laughs> but the difference for Microsoft, this is just very specifically Microsoft. Mm. If you look at the past, you can pick your time frame, several years, 10 years, 15, whatever it is. There have been these hype cycles, like you said. They've, they've been very Microsoft focused, right? So like Microsoft Teams is something I think people out in the world, like my wife has heard of because she has to deal with it sometimes. Yeah. But that's about as close as you can get to anything like this. This is this is broad mainstream appeal, evening news, local newspapers. Like by the way, this by is, accident, right? Like that's what I mean. By it's accident, like yeah. So this they is not, they, um, they stumbled into an experiment that resonated with a hundred million people that apparently were desperate for existential conversations with a yep. piece of software, and. Yep. And, and then a marketing PR team inside of Microsoft grabbed onto it and ran yeah. with it. And so far, so good. Bing AI had that uptake. That, you know, Microsoft, not your father's Oldsmobile, right? Yeah. Uh, we can overcome that little bit of brand dissonance. They People, even, it's like, it's Bing? <laughs> Bing? Oh, is it Bing? Okay. It's Bing. I guess it's Bing. So now like, we, we just accept that, you know, now this is okay. And yeah. now uh, I have a conversational yeah, yeah, I have yeah, a good no. conversation with a bad search engine. Excellent. That's right. <laughs> I know. Anyhow, I, I, I feel like I good and bad that it came out of all Microsoft's antitrust stuff for sure. Mm -hmm. Um I, I and, and the antitrust good, ended Richie, in twenty eleven, right? The consent decree ended yeah. in twenty eleven. It's been gone longer than it's existed. I know. I know, but we entered the, you know, Sachin Dillow, it was 2013, 20, 13, you know, but um, yeah, that build event in 2014 was when you first really saw Sachin doing his thing with a three hour keynote. Yeah. Followed yeah. by him, in, <laughs> you know, well, you know, the kinder <laughs> followed, followed by him insulting the whole Microsoft. Grace Hopper conference. And then he went to CEO <laughs> school. Like, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We don't remember yep. that. That's um, uh, that's a good, uh, 
good memory. It's always good when the CEO of the company refers to your product as my office at the time, 365. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, which is exactly what we all call no. it. Um, it I, but it's the a polishing step ahead of MS it was amazing, too. Yeah. Like a year later, he had been to CEO school. That's interesting. And he was slick. Yeah, because all I remember you know. is him as a, as a slick CEO. I yeah, but that first that. year, that was a bumpy first year. I told yeah, you the first time I ever met him, Ward Ralston introduced him to me. He was he had was on part of the Windows Server team. I was there yeah. for a reviewer's con. Uh, he had hair. Workshop. I'd never heard of this guy, so he, I shook his hand and I said, "Oh, good, fresh meat." Oh, Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh my God, Paul. that was my one time. <laughs> oh, so great! He never. It's weird. He hasn't seen me again. since. Yeah. I, <laughs> oh my God! All right. On that note. Yep. Uh, can we take a break, or are you finished sure. uh, ranting? What a ranting! I'm no, it actually, wasn't a rant. It was kind of mild. <laughs> I was hoping for more, to be honest, to be frank. I'm just, I'm just pointing out that this kinder, gentler Microsoft, I think, has disappeared. Yeah. It's uh, well, you know, I've been reading, uh, the, you know, all these sad departures. Yeah, uh, no, they're they're not being kind and gentle to their own people. No. Like it really is an odd. I know it's a culture crazy. hit. Yep. And, yeah, and that, it, by the way, that's that's a, another point on in that uh, list of points, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the way, it, not just the way they've gotten rid of people, but who they've gotten rid of, yeah, uh, makes no sense. It's, but it, but odd. everybody's doing, and I don't, I really don't understand it because these are all profitable, highly yep. profitable businesses. I mean, usually yes. you don't lay people off, especially in 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 five figure numbers, unless uh, you know you're in trouble. Right. So it's just it's I mean same thing at all these other companies too. It's really um, that's the right. I I can't hold Microsoft any more accountable than any no, other big tech it. company. But I do yeah, no, think it's, but that's only if you're if you're me. But if you're me doing it, it's the ten thousand people on an at eight a.m. on a Monday, and then it's over. This yeah. rolling drag it out. Oh my god! Over and over and over again. Like I I, it's so demoralizing right. to the and I you know the rest of the company. Basically, all my Twitter feed is now is people saying goodbye, um, mm -hmm. which in a way is not <laughs> well. Right. And which also kind of looking for it. Twitter and also <laughs> yeah, no, shocked, right? Yeah. Like yeah. that's the thing. It's like yeah. it's yeah, it's yeah. Not just that they're being After like, ten oh, years working side. on Azure and yeah. twenty years at the company, I'm now looking for work. It's like, right. oh, my God. Which is not something those kinds of people should be thinking about. Yeah. Well, not either that, that I, or... Not that I don't think they're going to get scooped up, right? Like, generally speaking, we still have a lot of jobs in tech that need to be filled. Well, this is what's right. interesting, and they're not in big tech companies, that there are huge numbers of openings in normal companies like mine and yours. That we, we can't get these people because big tech's been stealing them effectively. Yeah. With stock options, and, and now they're and arguably overstole them. Like back yeah, to yeah. they hired oh, we got forty thousand people in twenty twenty two. Yep, right. Like that's just a lot of people. But they're going back into the workplace, and uh, yeah, I hope they're finding a gainful yeah. employee. I and I think you know Paul makes this point. It's like it sure feels like there's fear for the latter half of this year in terms of revenue. Well, hey, look what's happened with PCs. Let's uh, all of these markets. I think this is the bump after the pandemic yeah. and the re and the bump from the did, supply chain you, problems. The point I had made months ago was: did, did we not understand that there was an irrational euphoria yeah. in big tech during the pandemic? Yes. That this thing that was, flo you know, floating their boat there was going to stop. <laughs> like eventually, the pandemic doesn't. It, it was the hard stop. I think we were all looking for, but it wound down. No, the Maybe. buying spree ends. Right. I mean, did we, you know. Amy uh, Hood, the CFO of Microsoft, came out during it. You can find it. It's in a conference call. She's like, we, we had no idea how important Windows was. I mean, uh, our mistake. Uh, what? What? <laughs> like, what are you doing? Why would you say that out loud? Yeah. <laughs> Even if it's true, don't say that. That's Quiet stupid. Part it out makes loud. you look bad. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Windows. Well, who knew? I we. Yeah. Who knew? I don't know. Maybe the eight to 11 billion in revenues it earns every quarter might have been the. <laughs> oh, no. We didn't know. You know? And yeah. nothing? No. Totally surprised. It was a shock so, to us. Yeah, yeah, but sometimes that language is for a market reaction, right? It's, right. This is not about what they actually think. It's what they need to say. Oh, that's interesting. But I can't uh, find a way uh, to justify yeah. tormenting your staff for three months. No. Like well, that, no, and, and especially in the bizarre. wake of massive overstaffing that occurred yeah. everywhere in big tech, right? Yes. And that's what I mean. It's not just Microsoft. I, I, they're not alone in this, but 
I don't understand how, how you couldn't have seen that this was temporary. Mm. Yeah, you mm. overhired by 10,000 people, so you tortured 200,000. Mm -hmm. I don't understand the math. Oh, and among them, some of your longest-term employees, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. the, the public faces of things in many mm -hmm. cases, uh, excellent speakers, excellent communicators. Um, it just, what are you doing? Yeah. And, of course, you, they are crying all the way to the bank with big severances. Sure. But sure. um, and and speaking kindly of them being tossed well, yes, aside one unceremoniously. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> that's, on one, that's why you do that now because you can, you've got the money to fire them equitably. Mm. Yeah. Is that possible? Okay. At the same time, like why do the it so noisily? Equitably? Like how how does the what is the PR value of letting these people go publicly? Right, and and slowly over time, like it baffles me. Right. Uh, let's take a little break. If you don't mind, I'd like to and talk about our fine sponsor. Brand new, actually. Lookout. Welcome. Welcome, Lookout. Welcome. Uh, business has changed, as you probably noticed, and I think probably forever. Um, boundaries to where we work or even how we work have disappeared. We're hybrid. We're remote. We're on-prem. But it means your data is always moving around, right? Hybrid, remote, on-prem, whether it's on a device, in the cloud, across networks, or at the local coffee shop. Now, that's wonderful for your workforce. They're happy, but it's a challenge for IT security, as you might imagine. Lookout, Lookout helps you control your data and free your workforce. You can do both. With Lookout, you'll gain complete visibility into all your data. You can maximize security and minimize risk from external and internal threats, plus ensure compliance. By seamlessly securing hybrid work, your organization doesn't have to sacrifice productivity and employee happiness for security. Lookout makes IT security much, much simpler. The, you know, you, you probably feel that pain of working with multiple point solutions and legacy tools. Uh, and doing that in, 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 the, in the challenging environment we've got today is, is just it's too complex. It's a recipe for disaster. With its single unified platform, Lookout reduces IT complexity, giving you more time to focus on whatever comes your way. Good data protection shouldn't be a cage. It's a springboard, letting you and your organization bound boing, toward a future of your making. Visit Lookout.com today to learn how to safeguard your data, secure hybrid work, reduce IT complexity. It's simple. Lookout.com. We thank them and... Welcome them to Windows Weekly, and good to have you aboard. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Thurot, what you know, uh, and and Richard Campbell when he gets back from his tea run, um, mm -hmm. Teams is looking much more svelte these days. No, so uh, Microsoft kind of teased this a few months back. Uh, we've known it was coming. You know, the old Teams was based on Electron, um, and so now they're up. They're they're back. Or they're announcing and will roll out broadly in the next couple of months, the new version of Teams, which sounds like an Apple product, right? It's two times faster. It uses 50% less memory. Like these are big numbers, right? This is, you know, how awful was the other app? Well, have you used it? So actually these things kind of make sense. The big thing to me though, isn't so much, you know, there's a new design sort of, it still looks like Teams to me, but the big thing here is going to be the multiple profile support, uh, which is something... We've had on Teams on mobile, but not on desktop, which has never made a lot of sense. Um, but we're getting it now, finally, on like what I would call big teams, you know, the the, the mainstream desktop clients. Big so boy we teams. argue this is the solution to tenantitis. <laughs> yeah. What's tenantitis? So wait a minute, what's that? tennis problem? No, no, wait. <laughs> is that when your elbow hurts? Yeah. Yeah. Your elbow definitely hurts because you keep having to switch between accounts to see which one can I actually oh. go to this meeting on. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, I've got <laughs> exactly the right. thing that says yep. go join meeting, but yeah. I can join the meeting because it's in one of the other tenants. Right. And for better or worse, because I'm often a beta tester on this stuff, I have a tenant that's just marked Microsoft. There you go. And it what it does is break things. Like never click on that. Because the scary part about the full Teams client is It'll actually change the security association of Windows when you switch that tenant. Like oh, all boy. kinds of apps suddenly break because I'm now a different person inside this I machine. See. Okay. And so then you get into the problem between the active, the Azure 
identity and the MSA, the original Microsoft identity. And heaven help right. you if you happen to use the same email address for both because you didn't know. And oh, now the God, order of login matters. Uh, yes, this is the, the dumbest thing Microsoft has ever allowed. Yep. Someone on a corporate account or what I call a work or school account uh, to use that as a Microsoft account. And then God help them. They start subscribing to Xbox services yep. or making purchases or whatever it is. And it's like, guys. You're going to lose everything because there is no transition. Listen, I don't end. The identity problem is on Microsoft is a legacy problem. It's decades and decades of stuff. I'm, I've been calling identity the third rail of Microsoft <laughs> because it, it destroys careers inside of Microsoft. To try yeah. and solve that problem, it, it's unbelievably this is, difficult. Uh, I'm afraid you, what you have done is um, you've kicked the wood pile and the cockroaches mm -hmm. are going to start coming out and the snakes because million years ago microsoft offered this way i in ie i guess where you could kind of switch between uh, microsoft accounts right at, on the fly and then they got rid of it because there was some big problem who knows it's and i'm talking this like 20 years ago it's a long time ago and um people still ask for this or they'll ask for like well um they must they'll, they must someday offer the ability for me to transition from one microsoft account to another this would solve that work and school account problem where you turn that into a Microsoft account, you maybe lost your job, you're leaving school, whatever it is. You're like, well, I want all that stuff. Can I move it over to a, you know, an Outlook.com account? It's like, yeah, nope, you can't. No. <laughs> um, and, and you understand how this happened, right? Like you think back yeah. to, you know, before Azure at all, it's like each of these different Microsoft properties had its own identity stack. Yep. There were dozens of them. Yeah. The idea that we can consolidate that, like... That's this third rail stuff, passport. man. Remember that? Well, yeah. You, you, of course you remember. But I, the, we were there. Yeah. They, were, they yep. were trying to do OAuth long before OAuth. Of course, they also timed the announcement of that right as they were declared a pernicious monopoly. So that went well. <laughs> That's right. It's like, That's right. hey, we may be a monopoly, That's but right. give us all your identity information. Well, this is right. So, yeah, <laughs> so, um, Microsoft had an initial, it was .NET My Services, a uh, hailstorm announcement mm -hmm. where they actually had a bunch of partners show up. American Express was one. Yeah. Uh, they were all going to do this. And then within, I want to say, two, three months, yeah, every one of them, but I uh, backed out. They were like, they, like no, we're absolutely not doing this. And it's not because the technology no. was bad. It was a PR yep, catastrophe. Was, the timing was, was yeah, horrifying. Yeah. Yep. And and it's kind of amazing that nobody sort of took a step back after those announcements. It is. And, and, and said, hey, this is going to go badly for us. This is exactly the argument that companies did not make with Apple and Google with the mobile app store initially, at least mm -hmm. not in force, which was we don't want another company standing between us and our customers. Right. And uh, with Microsoft, they said no. With Apple, they were like, eh. Well, Apple, had, Apple <laughs> you know, you may get in. Apple didn't set out to make the store. They needed to because the phone had been jailbroken. Yeah. And their whole pitch was, here's how we stop this from exploiting the phone. Right. right? We're going to take the liability that it go through this. We we vet it. It's going to be okay. And we'll take 30%. Whatever. You know. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, and you like can't an, speak to your like customer directly anymore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just a given. Right? It was in the notes. That it, it the other the the other thing about the Teams announcement is it's the end of Electron, right? Yeah, well, at least right. for Teams. Yeah, well, a lot of other listen. things use Electron. You think it's the end of Electron? That would be so great. Well, I think it's a shot over the bow. My presumption when GitHub it's got also acquired, the end of UWP and uh, well, all the other the, Microsoft technologies they rejected in favor of React, right? Well, <laughs> <laughs> they're all dead. It's, well, and they're all dead in a, in, a, in a coffin called Maui. But, you know, they're yeah, doing, they're not using they're doing Maui, their best right? to keep... They're trying to keep that one alive. Like, at least they're consolidating there. We'll see how it why goes. Why didn't they? Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, do you know? Why didn't they what? Why, why are they using... I mean, I'm I'm happy to see them using React, but I'm just... that's Isn't that a Facebook tool? I mean, I'm just surprised well, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but it's... They have, they're just going where developers are, you know? Yeah. I'm surprised well, they haven't adopted Flutter at this point, honestly. Yeah, it, and that it, would be hysterical. <laughs> yeah, it's also a phenomenally good tool, right? Like, it, yeah. it, therein yeah. lies the real problem. Do you remember when, uh, when they wanted to move all of the Bing blogs to an Active Service Page solution, and, and the ASP guys didn't want to do it, so they moved to WordPress, and that meant wow. actually using the MySQL backend too. Wow. So now the SQL Server guys are like, "What the, you know." Yeah. It, if you just go best of breed for technologies, sometimes you send a message to your customers or prospective customers too. So 
You know, they're, they're, they're definitely up against this. But the, the bottom line was there was an expectation that electron, with Electron being more closely associated with Microsoft, it was going to get dramatically better. And that didn't happen. Is that, well, Electron's GitHub, right? That's right. So because Microsoft, owned, but it yeah. predates Microsoft with GitHub. Without a doubt. They, they bought yes. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Yeah. And so the assumption was now the Windows team and the Electron team are going to be friendly and they're, there's going to be optimizations that happen in Windows to allow Electron to perform better. Right. It's like make Windows the best Electron host possible. Does not appear to have happened. Yeah. And I the, and that the is proof possible. is they moved off of it. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, the fact that they would move away from that and, and do an alternative rather than just like, you own the stack, why not improve it? Oh, what else is wrong right. then that you've decided that the better way to improve this is to do it a different way? Right. So the new one is React, isn't it? Is that uh, the is that the technology? They replaced Angular. They're not using, um, I'm trying to find where, where I saw this. I, I mean, what, what I'm basing this on is a, is a tweet or a tweet from somebody saying what yeah look how microsoft fine. didn't use maui didn't hey, use listen at, UWP, Leo, at this point as use... long as it's not ai i'll take it yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's react and webview right something like that but it, and a lot of that has is to do everything to do with timing right the like, maui is still yeah. very new this has been in the works clearly for years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and so now they're finally getting to a well, place where it you know they they had to they had to do it a different way and so, yeah, going from Ang Electron and Angular to WebView 2 and React. Which is more modern. The f I, not to, I don't want to get off on a massive sidetrack, but it's mm -hmm. possible that the future of MAUI, which is Microsoft's kind of, sort of Flutter-like cross-platform development suite or whatever, Xamarin, replace Xamarin Forms replacement, is this integration they have with Blazor, which is a web app technology. And maybe that is maybe that's where that goes in the future. Yeah. Maybe that this thing that is now kind of an add-on, you know, um, optional the, piece. Maybe that becomes the logical implementation is WebAssembly, right? Like that is the logical yeah. way to do this. Yep. The, 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 the advantage of operating in the context of the browser is you already have a security perimeter, right? When I put yep. my IT guy hat on, what do I want? Stop installing software on my computer. They're all vulnerability problems. We already have a browser. So as long as you can run in that context, we know what the security envelopes like life is good. Just don't make yeah. it suck. So, right. So, that right, that it's it, in a very general way. What you basically just said was, this uses the good part of the browser, right? Whereas Electron is like the bad part of the browser. It's like we want something as big and heavy as Chrome, but yeah. well, we're going to take dependency on Chrome, <laughs> you so you're know, going to see all these Chrome instances. The browser. But we're also going to work in JavaScript yeah. so that we make the most un unmanageable piece of code we possibly can. <laughs> right. right? And, you know, exactly. and, and you know, it may be somewhat functional and somewhat object oriented, but it certainly can consume a lot of memory. So let's run a bunch of it. <laughs> uh, where so you use you have used the new teams right and it, uh, do you actually i mean do you aside from the fact that i know it looks a little different but do you actually notice uh no not a thing is yeah i was gonna because i mean honestly i feel like i don't i i feel like i would be sensitive to this i i hate teams for a lot of reasons but i've never once thought i'm like okay like come on start up already let's go like I, it's never felt slow and day-to-day -day no usage Wait, you, the problems you have with it, teams is it forgot all of your devices again, so now you're mm -hmm. you're trying. That's to, all UX stuff. Yeah, yeah it's yep. now trying to use the microphone on the camera and the speakers in the in right. in, well, yeah. in in the monitor. That's a big update. And, That's why. And then yeah. the tenant, right? The tenant is the problem, and so the, the fact yeah, they're exactly. tackling the tenant That's problems right. are smart. Uh, but it also shows Teeper and Co that they can completely rewrite Teams, and it's not the end of the world. Did you so, look? Did you use a resource monitor just to see if it uses less RAM or? I, I'm going to have to run it for a while. You yeah. know, it's it's the rot yeah, over time that matters. Because that's the complaint, of course, with Electron is it's just a pig. Yeah, right. And that's and that isn't Electron. But, that's JavaScript. Oh, right? is like it? Really? That is those uh, engines. Yeah. If uh, you've got to use JavaScript, because JavaScript doesn't clean itself up particularly well. But isn't right. so we, we've gone over this, I think. But Visual Studio Code isn't that Electron? It is. It is Electron. Are they rewriting I, it? I'm no. telling you, this thing is fast and light and yeah. And very I'm, well, maybe and some, okay, very actually, well say. written, right? Like that. Yeah. There's where they really leaned on it, what yeah. Electron's good at. It may be that the, the complaint about Electron isn't really so much that it's a pig; it's just that it's a whole browser bundled into a an app. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and one and for and each focus, app, and it's just it offends it's a, people. That's all. Yeah. Well, and it's a focus on cross-platform, which makes life hard, yeah. right? Like yeah. it's very difficult to me. 
VS Code good everywhere, but that team has done a great job of it. I think the, the team's yeah. folks are moving yeah, much no, more I, quickly I, with honestly, a much broader feature set. Basically identical, from what I can tell. I mean, it works really well cross-platform. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. I would argue Teams a, um, 3 will probably be with... WebAssembly. And web because WebAssembly allows you to operate in that context, but bring your own language. Okay. Yep. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. We're just it's a path. Like now that they've got control of this code base to the point where they're willing to do that, there are many other choices. But it also right. is a shot across the bow of Electron to say, be better. Because there, because there are are alternatives, and that we're always better off when there's more than one way to solve this problem. Hey, Microsoft has a rich history of not using its own technology stack, so <laughs> this is entirely in keeping. It's especially when they're problematic, right? Yep, yep. Hmm. Okay, I am really curious to see this. Um, I, I mean, I'm kind of stuck. I have to use Teams. You know, I don't really have a choice. So. Now, you, you and I both, and that's sort of reality. Yeah, but you know, here we are using Zoom. And the new version of Zoom is WebAssembly. I, I heard that as Zoom, and I thought, oh, what a nice word that <laughs> that is. well, in a related story, uh, it looks like you will be able to use Teams on uh, your Surface Hub 2S. Yeah. So this was <laughs> see how I got back to the point that I missed. You see how I did that? Yeah. Are you grateful um, or mad? I mean, <laughs> I am. I am. So I don't. I don't even know how to describe this story because it was, my, the initial Microsoft blog post was so incorrect <laughs> that I had. I read it three times. I changed the story I wrote about it three times oh, after wow. I published it, and then in, this morning I got up and some guy from Microsoft said, "Hey, um, there's actually two mistakes in this story oh, that you geez. wrote, but it's not your fault because they were wrong in the initial." Maybe Chat GPT four <laughs> so wrote it. That's probably why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that this is the future, right? So, all right, so I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around this because there hasn't been a lot of news in this front because of the pandemic. But before the pandemic, Microsoft had something called Surface Hub. Mm -hmm. Remember? Surface Hub came in a 55-inch and an 82-inch version. Uh, these were their collaborative screens. Multiple people could stand in front of it, write on it together at the same time. It was designed for that world of the past where we used to meet together in rooms. It was fun. And then... They were coming out with the second gen version. And the second gen version, there was going to be two. There was going to be the 2X. That's the exciting one. Remember, you could put multiple screens together. They were on tripods and everything. It was going to be amazing, gorgeous looking thing. And then they came out with something called 2S, which was based on the old design, where they were going to bring the, so the software from 2X forward uh, and still have 55 and 82 inch versions. Okay, cool. Then the pandemic happened. And it was like, oh, no one is going in rooms no, together. So nobody needs this. They, they, Nobody needs this anymore. So what they did, I actually thought this was kind of cool of them. They said, we're going to allow owners of these devices to install Windows 10 Pro or, or Enterprise on them and just use them as giant PCs, basically, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to, you're going to have that experience. You'll have all the software, whiteboard, everything's there. And uh, because no one is meeting in rooms together, we're going to do this thing. Separately from this, Microsoft came out with something called uh, Microsoft or Teams Rooms, right? right? Which is a very much what it sounds like. It is a... It's basically kind of the the software version of the original Surface Hub idea. We're get, we're going back to rooms now where there's going to be people there, but there are also going to be people that are not there. So it's like a hybrid meeting solution, which software. was always a part of Surface, Solutions. right? Like Surface Hub was always about yes. and every person yep. can but be we're remote. Gonna, yeah, kind of take it out of Surface. In other yeah. words, make a a market for a third party Surface Hub like devices, right? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of Teams rooms devices now, and. Uh, Obviously, if you have a Surface Hub, you're like, well, hold on a second. I mean, I have a Surface Hub. How come I can't do this? You know, so what they just announced was this is the, I'm just going to say it correctly, not what they said, but if you have an existing Surface Hub 2S, you will, I don't want to call it upgrade because you could have taken it from Surface Hub OS to Windows 10 to Teams Room OS, right? But you're going to yeah. be able to put Teams Room OS on this thing if you have one already. And a second gen Surface Hub 2S is coming out this fall. That will have this built in automatically. I don't know. We don't know anything about that yet. If it's going to be upgraded hardware, you know, nobody knows. The conversations I've had uh, around it was Hub a very was, confusing post. This this was the product that was replacing old projectors, right? And yeah. instead of buying a new projector for the office that you would plug your laptop and so forth in, and now we have the screen, and it's actually the whole computer, and so yeah. it's configured for collaboration. It's configured for that kind of work. It's simpler yeah. for you to use. 
bring your identity right. to the device rather than bring your device to the room. Yeah, the the uh, most computing devices, you as the individual, you're signed in and you're on that device. It's you and your device. Mm -hmm. And with the Service Hub, you could have multiple people signed in at the yeah. same time. Um, you could have multiple people with pens, giant Surface pens that look like markers. You could write on it and collaborate on a whiteboard, whatever. Um, there were, you know, over time, teams came to it, other apps, et cetera, et cetera. So it's followed a very interesting path. I don't know. Because they haven't said, I don't know whatever, if anything is going to happen to the 2X product, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think I, but it's got, it again. got canceled, right? Like, it, it I think it's good. Yeah, yeah. But you know, these are these are originally Alex Kipman products that then got took over oh, by other oh, teams and evolved. Geez, right. I hope he took really? them with him. Yeah. I remember they remember <laughs> they originally was a table, right? And then they've evolved from there. Yeah. yeah and so the, table, yeah. The, uh, the software was always the weak part with all of this. Didn't they buy like, a company, yeah. though, Pixel Perfect, that did... Yeah, pixel big, they did the screen, pixel yeah. sense, the big, big screen. So that's the original hub. Well, I remember the table because I remember going like to casinos. The table that the pixel the sense table. display. They mm -hmm. they yeah. took the name pixel sense sense for the surface displays. Yeah, and then the the big pixel sense became basically the eighty two inch surface hub. Became the hub, and the, and the software was the battle. Right, they were always trying to build custom versions of Windows and so forth. And now it's been subsumed yeah. by teams. Teams. As Teams. a common exactly. collaboration tool. Teams. And so, oh, that's right. Wow. Yeah. And don't worry, it's based completely in Electron, so it's going to run fast. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> well, But this know. is where this Teams Room OS comes from. So now I'm talking to IT right. folks that are retrofitting their their meeting spaces with Teams Rooms for exactly right. that reason. You don't have to bring your laptop in and waste that 20 minutes That's getting cool, it up actually. and running with the yeah. rig. You walk in, you log in, yes. and there's right. your presentation, off you go. That's actually great. And yeah. how much and does the, this thing yeah. cost? A well, yeah, billion so, dollars. <laughs> it's not cheap. Yeah, they're very right? expensive. I mean, yeah. the, the, yeah, the, I don't remember, the, uh, the price had gone up over time. I want to say the small one might be in a five grand range, and the big one is or maybe five to eight grand. It was Google, yeah, they, they actually they grand, came I think, down. The, Google briefly yeah, sold so something there. like this, but it was more like a Fisher Price version yep. of it, but I think they stopped. That's right. But it's a great idea. And, uh, I, yeah, I, I, if I could uh, afford Pixel. it, I'd love it. There you go. I've got the Canadian prices. <laughs> the 50 inch is $12,000, and Jeez. the 85 inch is $29,000. That's Canadian. Yeah. So it's, I think Those it's a Canadian eight, money. Yeah. So $1.50 and four bucks. 10, I think <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Anyway, so, but, but people have asked me, why would they, why would they sell these things when you can get less expensive? You know, interactive displays for meeting rooms and uh, it has many of which are going built to be in. Teams rooms mm -hmm. compatible. Yeah. Well, because it's Microsoft, right? I think uh, some people, you know, you're you have some enterprise uh, servicing agreement with Microsoft. You're buying, you might be buying uh, fleets of Surface devices mm -hmm. for your customer, your uh, users rather. Um, this is just it's you're just kind of all in on it. The, the Surface Hub story was always hilarious because I think they made to build them as reference devices so that Lenovo and HP. <laughs> would build them mm -hmm. and then everybody ordered them to the point where you couldn't get one at one point it was like a yeah, two yeah. year waiting yeah. list to get a surface hub yeah uh, what was the what was the google thing called I, that's bugging me i can't think of oh that. yeah it was some it had a funny name and it this, looked like it was an easel yeah i can't remember uh, surface yeah hub. this was the one where you could turn it so they could have two of them and turn them sideways and they'd merge and meld and that was the x that was the 2x that one 2X. was amazing yeah. yeah, they didn't. Well, it was that gone. We saw, it was we, amazing we, in demo. Like we never really saw never a production happened. version of it, right? Because the pandemic happened. So yeah, it was probably build 2019, right? Right before the pandemic. Yeah, we got to play with them hands on. They were great. We were like, "Yep, this is really, you know, this is the future." And then the future wasn't the future. Jamboard. 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 Yeah, Jamboard. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that was the pixel thing. I'm surprised yeah. with a name like that. Every you know, time they like, rang up a sale, the thing would say, you've got jam. You've got jam. You can actually, uh, <laughs> during the, uh, one of the things that happened during the Twitter auction is they sold a bunch of jam boards. Jam, but jam boards, yeah. <laughs> sure. Which it was, I think was a sign of excellent decision making on that company's part that they had so many. Yeah. 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 But the the great thing about this Teams Room OS is that it's it's already up and running. Like you don't have to start up right. Teams. You don't have to wait for the update. You don't have to switch the tenant. Like That's all right. of that stuff is done. You walk into the meeting room, <laughs> you and it already shows that your meeting's about to start. So it already knows what identity you should be using, right? Because you've got it on a calendar. So you're just getting the the there seems to be, and I know this is Jeff Deeper. How many minutes from right. the time that the meeting was supposed to start to you're actually doing the meeting? 
And all of the stuff they're doing there is about <laughs> shortening that cycle up. All right, I love it. I think it's great. All right. Um, and you see, you know, there's a show I like to watch. Jeff Cooper story on uh, HBO called Succession. And oh, yes. uh, mm -hmm. just came back, first episode. New season. New yep. season. And, it, and the first thing is the kids sitting around, and I think now as I think about it, it must be a Surface Hub, a big screen. They're in a meeting with some designers sure. who are showing something. And the, and it's a TV. It's a big TV in the living room. Oh, but wait a minute. No, it, maybe because then he closes the laptop. To hang up on him, he closes the laptop. And it goes free. <laughs> so maybe it's not a hub, come to think of it. Well, it could also just be. Just, uh, just remoting a display. Yeah. Yeah, it could also just be writers, display. right? That they decided that's how they're going to shut it down. Yep. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's perfect. Yeah, right. Because otherwise it's not as effective as slamming yeah. the left. And, like, the, the funny <laughs> thing is like a Surface Hub today would probably look like it has giant bezels. It, it would, would probably, you know, compared to. Yeah. We have yeah. these beautiful um, 4K TVs now, 8K TVs, whatever, with like zero, you know, and they look like infinity pools. Like this thing probably looks like a plasma TV set from the you know early two thousands. Yeah, they're, anyway, you're not wrong. Yeah, and I think probably <laughs> I'm just you know comparatively speaking, a well you know, the, set the, up that world. I mean, our came room, to a crashing halt. Right, our room, uh, our conference room, has just a big screen TV attached to a computer. It's a Mac Mini, but attached to a computer. Yeah. It's still you still have to do the whole thing where you you know, but you can yeah. with Apple's you can AirPlay, so it's not horrible but we don't have a projector it's not so i would imagine that's how a lot of rooms are these days right pa the old powerpoint sure. projector thing is gone no well, you're exactly right and we tried to do mirror cast and all these other options but it was simpler to put a cold pc into the screen yes and yeah, have it pre-logged right. into the team's tenant and already knowing what thing was supposed to start so mm -hmm. that you just you know, I always love these conference call meetings where, you know, instead of just calling the guy on the phone, now we're going to do a conference call space first Ugh. so that we can have 20 minutes of aggravation before we start our meeting because that'll help get us off on the yeah. right foot. And yep. then you have the polycom yep. in the middle of the table and everybody's yeah, shouting. Exactly. <clears throat> no wonder so how do you have those like kinds of work. collaboration meetings and not have them suck? Yeah. Like, I think it's, it's, a, it's a worthy well, goal. Well, I think it's important if you're going to have them. First, you spend $20,000 on the screen. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> then you spend the first 20 minutes of every meeting now you're, yelling you're, at each other. Now you're yeah. obligated. You don't have a choice. Now you're collaborating. Now yeah. you're collaborating. I feel like um, I, it seems like there would be other third party solutions. Like Cisco must have. Well, WebEx yeah. must have. Oh, there are many. Yeah, yeah. Lenovo yeah. has one. No, but this is. Like Lenovo makes a Teams the, device, right? Oh, like interesting. A dedicated Teams yeah. device. Yeah, yeah, there you go. But I, this, to me, this is Microsoft going back to its roots. It's it's odd for Microsoft to I, to do the first party device thing when it's so good at partnering, mm -hmm. and these other companies are so good at making hardware yeah. and can do it so much less expensively. But when you can't persuade uh, them to do it, their you business. build. You can't talk them into doing yeah. it. So you build the first one, you make it really right. expensive, and then have it sell anyway. And it's like, listen, there's lots of room underneath this for you to undercut us. Oh, my God, of right? course. Yep. And that's, yep. the, that's the reference hardware mindset. I'll show you a proof of right. concept. I'll make it sufficiently successful so you folks can all make a less expensive one. Yeah. So, I mean, this, I, this is, this is the, uh, to me, is the way this uh, oh, Now we're quoting the Mandalorian. Did you really say this is the way? Okay. <laughs> I, well, I, I tried not to. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, <laughs> so uh, in another bit of good news, uh, two weeks ago, you may recall Microsoft released Edge version 111, and you'll recall it if you use Edge because there's a gigantic, the biggest Batman icon logo looking yeah, Bing the icon biggest. up on the taskbar, uh, up on the uh, address bar, mm -hmm. toolbar that you can't get rid of. So I had, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, I had the little tip, you know, this is how you can do it. You had to go into, you know, you had to go into it, and it's it's not easy. And and the chances were they would upgrade Edge to version 112, and it would come back. You'd have to do it again, blah, 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 whatever. Did well, you notice they updated it they, so as, if you don't just fly over the icon, that thing pops out? You actually have to hover over it for a moment, and then it pops out. Right. But it pops just out like on exactly. every Edge browser that's open on your machine. You know they do this on purpose. You know they do. <laughs> it, it's not a mistake. It's not an, oh, I, oh, yeah, no, we'll fix that in the future. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, well, they heard your complaints. Actually, let me correct that. They didn't hear your complaints, but I can assure you they heard their complaints from their their business customers who said, what the flying whatever is yeah. this? 
And so Microsoft has reissued Edge version 111. And now there is UI to remove that button, as is their policy. Mm -hmm. So that if you're a business and you don't want your users to see this stupid bit of UI, you can get rid of it. Um, and so the way you do that uh, now is to go in. Oh, you have yeah. to use policy to edge, though. I can't do it myself. For... I can't do it all by myself. You can do it. Oh. You can. You can. Because I like the... Um, I like just, the, uh, the search bat, settings the for Batman discover. logo. There's a button in there called so Is it is it kind of like it's kind of like the the bat signal kind of it is, isn't it? I just I'm just yeah. impressed at how yeah, like big little, it is. Uh, how, how, what did they have to do <laughs> to make that icon right. bigger than everything yeah, else? You're right. I know. Like is there so literally gross. custom code to allow it to draw it larger than the toolbar? <laughs> Right. Like, it's astonishing. The, yeah, the address bar is now like five pixels taller because yeah. that button had a squeeze in there. They write it into the uh I don't know. They write it into the memory map of the video card directly. Yeah. <clears throat> it's horrible. All right. Anyway, you can get rid of it. Now, I, I want to so. take a little break and then we have still more to talk mm -hmm. about, of course. Sure we because do. Because there will never ending it's a never ending source of <laughs> font of fascination. Yep. Microsoft three sixty five. I think we can stick some AI in. And, of course, Xbox and distillation will be the topic of the week. <laughs> now that you've got your mash and, you, and you've got and your you, alcohol, it's time you got to... got it to the wash. Guys, you can't jump into the middle. you got to go back to the beginning. <laughs> start, at the, start at the front. Work yeah. your way back. Yep. Uh, our show today brought to you by a great company called Collide. K-O-L-I-D-E. It's for companies that use Okta. But there's a problem with authentication. You know, Okta is great. The idea is uh, your identity provider lets only lets known devices log into your apps, into your cloud, all that stuff, right? That's good. Zero trust. What about, though, if this known person logging in is logging in on an insecure device? That's a big problem, Right. If you're an Okta user, Collide can solve this problem. Get your entire fleet to 100% compliance by patching this major hole in Zero Trust architecture, device compliance. Just because a device is known doesn't mean it's in a secure state. In fact, plenty of the devices in your fleet probably shouldn't be allowed in. They shouldn't be trusted. Maybe they're running an out-of-date version of the operating system. Maybe they've got, I don't know, unencrypted credentials. Their uh, their keys lying in a you know, a download folder somewhere. Oh, that would never happen, right? Mm -hmm. If a device isn't compliant or it's not running the Collide agent, it just can't get in. It cannot access the organization's SaaS apps or other resources. It can't log into your company's cloud apps, not until the problem's been fixed. It's, it's that simple. But here's another part you're going to love, especially if you're in the IT department. You don't have to fix it. The user does. That's what Collide does so well. You know, without Collide, IT teams have really have a problem solving these compliance issues or just even just to stop insecure devices from logging in. With Collide, you can set and enforce compliance across your entire fleet, completely cross-platform, Mac, Windows, and Linux. It makes a device compliance part of the authentication process. So the user logs in with Okta, right? Collide says, whoa, hold on there. There's a compliance issue. You can't log in until you fix it. The end user, let's say uh, the end user uh, doesn't have an up-to-date to browser. Collide will say, hey, here's what's wrong. Here's why you can't log in. And more importantly, here's how you fix it. So they can get to 100% compliance and it doesn't overwhelm your IT department. They fix it. Plus, there's a side effect of this. The end user now understands security better and becomes part of your IT team, part of your security team. Really, that's what you want. You don't want them to be the adversary. You want them to be a partner. This is security you can feel good about because Collide puts transparency and respect for users at the center of the product. Collide's method means fewer support tickets, less frustration. Most importantly, 100% fleet compliance. K-O-L-I-D-E, collide.com slash WW. Learn more or book a demo. Collide.com slash WW. We thank him so much for supporting Windows Weekly. And you support Windows Weekly if you use that address. It's that way they know you saw it here. Not just Collide.com. Add the slash WW, please. Collide. It's just a good idea. 
On we go with Richard Campbell, run as radio and .NET rocks, Paul Therott, therott.com, and the field guide to Windows 11, and Windows Everywhere. Are they flying off the metaphorical shelves, Paul? I guess. I mean, I don't know. Just say yes. In what context? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Like it's pancakes. Like, 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 that's right. Everybody like wants flying to. toasters into screensaver. Ooh, do you mention flying toasters? <laughs> it am. is about history, right? I, uh, I <clears throat> yeah. All right, time to talk AI. What are we doing? We are uh, two weeks into yeah. the Chat GPT four era. Already fifteen thousand new startups. The singularity. The singularity is near. <laughs> um, people are getting scared. Yeah. Um and and Richard, thank you for reassuring us all that it's it's not anything to fear. The only fear oh, plenty, we have to fear. There's plenty to fear, oh, but okay. not the singularity. Not the singularity. You know, okay. Yeah. Yes. There's plenty to fear. Don't but don't fear this thing running off to do its own for comedic thing. purposes. Yeah. So, yeah. I there's there's an interesting back. Oh, I should I, I should by the way say part of my Microsoft is the Microsoft of old now is internally they are communicating to their salespeople to go out to their customers and say, oh, you don't want to use OpenAI. You want to use our implementation of the OpenAI stuff because, you know, blah, 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 whatever. Like, you know, we, we don't know where, I mean, if they're vetting their sources, we don't know anything about them. I mean, who are these guys? They're kind of just a little startup. I mean, um, so there's another little evil bit there. But uh, it would be interesting. You know, we talk about disruption and how, you know, uh, disruption in this industry is not going to come from Google, right? It's going to come from, some upstart and this notion that maybe chat gpt is that upstart and uh, except it's really microsoft week, isn't it i mean yeah but let's be clear no, paul that I mean, scenario well, you I mean, just microsoft painted invested a lot in them yeah but the scenario mm -hmm. you're painting is an individual who is whose bonus is tied to getting more people using the azure open yeah. ai service and so he's right. going to come up with a language he needs to to get you to do that that's right that's right but what I'm talking about is OpenAI. <laughs> so OpenAI is uh, announced this past week that they're going to add support for plugins to ChatGPT, right? Which it describes as extensions that allow it to integrate with third-party services and access up-to-date information, right? And I think this is the moment where OpenAI becomes like a platform. This is a very Microsoft thing to do to this. Um, and I think it was I think it was Rich, Richard who pointed out maybe a week or two ago that you know this thing, OpenAI, this thing <laughs> started out as sort of a a non commercial. You know we're not going to make money on this, right? Uh, there's a pro version of the service now. It's becoming a platform. Obviously, they license it to third parties. Um, I, I I think we may be witnessing uh, potentially, right? Because we really don't know. Uh, uh, the emergence of this thing that could replace Google search, basically. Um, and I think this is how you get there. So uh, potentially, right? And we'll see what happens, what actually happens. But it's have you the played with that Google's, Microsoft wanted to convey? Have you like, played with Google's response barred yet? It's pretty pathetic. No, Google is so unsophisticated that I have a Google Workspace account. I'm not. Oh, you can't. Even though I pay them more <laughs> money than Gmail users. You yeah. have to be a and humble I'm in user. Canada, no. And you can't be. You you can't use Bard in Canada. That's not a thing. That's a strange and foreign yeah. land. Well, would you like me to uh, to demonstrate it? Would you? Yeah. Give me a Bard well, query, so. <laughs> and I'll uh, I'll Bard it up for you. Ask Bard why it's not as sophisticated as OpenAI <laughs> and what it's going to do to ensure it's not. You know, Hi, I'm destroyed Bard. By external your forces. creative and helpful collaborator. I have limitations and won't always get it right, but your feedback will help me improve. I love how suddenly technology is being honest. <laughs> I, you know, like, did Siri ever come out and say this? All no. Siri ever says to me is, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. And I'm like, I'm not talking to you. I, <laughs> You know, the, the smartest thing you could do is figure out that I'm not talking to you. Are you smarter than chat, oh, GPT, or Siri? Question mark. <laughs> It should say spit take. Everyone is smarter than Siri. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm smarter than Chat GPT or Siri. All of us are trained at different data sets and have different strengths and weaknesses. I'm good at generating text, translating languages, writing different kinds of creative content, 
and answering your questions. By the way, I love at the bottom, after its response, there's a button that says, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Let me show so, you what I found you on know, the web here, about so, that. But, oh, but hold on. Isn't the correct response to that question, yes, period? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, it gives you, what, actually, what it's this, better than yes. This it is gives the you, thing I talked about. It can also no, give you alternate drafts. Like, I... I, I didn't ask you to discuss in 300 words or more whether you were smart. Like, wait, I just asked you a simple yes or no question. Um, give me another question, then. Let's do something fun. Yeah. What could we ask him? Is Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard going to be approved by regulators? Oh, that's good. If it doesn't just say yes to this, I know this thing's broken inside. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I were a faster typer. Going to be a maybe the better question is on what day by will Microsoft's regulators. acquisition? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can ask it on what day as a follow up. It is slow. Okay. The acquisition of Activision Blizzard by Microsoft is still pending approval from regulators. The deal is being reviewed by antitrust authorities in the US, the EU, and other countries. There are concerns that the deal could give Microsoft too much power in the video game industry. Microsoft has said the deal will not harm competition and will be beneficial for gamers. I like to, I like sentences like, there are concerns. It's like mistakes were made. Mistakes mm -hmm. were made. There are concerns. It's still on, Sony is concerned. It is still unclear whether the deal will be approved so, yeah. by regulators. By the way, Japan now has said, yep, go ahead and do yeah. it. Yeah, it was rumored the EU <laughs> would. I don't think they've announced that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I have a feeling when it comes, when we come in front of the uh, administrative judge in August, they'll just go, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Go ahead. Thanks for delaying I think everything. When August comes, it will already have happened, but we'll see. Okay. Well, I think right, they try have one to more. Try another one. All right. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Multiply 587 by 326. 587 by 386. Can it do math? Let's see. I hope this reboots your computer. <laughs> is it 226,582? It does. Yeah. Oh, let's give it a thumbs up. Yeah. Yay! Wait, you finally invented a computer that can do math? <laughs> what future are we living in? Wait a minute. Dude, let me try, just press Google try it. Try that see. with Jet GPT and see how it goes. Yeah, there's a no. lot of math errors. Uh, yeah. Let's just search a Google oh, search and see what it gets. Well, I mean, this is where I think Google's got it going for because the back the the because the search engine does this yeah. just fine. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, Microsoft's uh, technology is all based on the original Pentium with the floating point. <laughs> bug. But see, now you get back to what was ChatGPT actually doing, which was playing with language models. Right, right. They don't have a mechanism right. that says, "Oh, this is a math problem. Use the math engine." They do now because of are, plugins. The, the the number of yeah. plugins is actually fascinating. Right, well, I haven't and, got and access to that. the point, yet. right? Is that you also think about how a human mind works where you were taught mathematics by rote to, to essentially right. program you to know there's a math engine you use in your head to do <laughs> math because yep. it has a deterministic My math answer. engine is a little broken, but yeah. yes. <laughs> Some math engines are better than others. But, mm -hmm. you, but the point being, when you're purely turning on language, these deterministic answers aren't reliable. Oh, uh, I like, okay, that's interesting. Just, hmm. just, a, every time we can get people to stop anthropomorphizing a piece of software and remind them where sure. the limits are. Well, let's start uh, with and pets it's just first. A tool. It's useful. <laughs> so, yeah, we got a ways to go. People oh, yeah. have names for their cars. This is a good answer. I asked it. Who said mistakes were made? The phrase mistakes were made is often mm -hmm. used in politics and business to acknowledge that something went wrong without taking responsibility for it. Honest to God. It has been used okay, by politicians I, such as U.S. Grant. Richard, did you know U.S. Grant used it? Uh, pre used President it. Lincoln, mistakes were made. What was your What was your question? What was your question? Who, Who said, said mistakes were made? Okay, I didn't Gr ask what the phrase meant. And, and well, no, but I'm getting I'm quotes here. Grant like said it. Nixon said there, it. Bill there Clinton. People in my lives who <laughs> can't answer questions clearly, and this is a good example of that kind of question. You, you've asked it a specific question, and it started off uh, on a wide-ranging discussion about what I didn't ask you what it means, you freaking idiot. I <laughs> Presumably, I know what it means. I asked you who said it. Oh, we finally got the rant. I, you, no, I mean, that's like, that's, 
But I like that's the an irritating application of technology. I do. I do appreciate that it did like a two hundred year span there from Ulysses S. Grant to Martin Wintercorn, which is that's Dieselgate, right? Like okay. it's a good span. I just, like, I, listen, I'm not asking. I, I'm not looking. It's not open mic night on Bard.com over here. I I want to know the answer to a question. I, it's well, you might prefer to me that it's providing additional information. You might prefer draft two. Which says the phrase "mistakes were made" is often attributed to U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant, who used it in December fifth, eighteen seventy-six, in his report to Congress. No, actually, I'm sorry. No, I didn't ask you who didn't say it. I, could you could you just tell me who said it? <laughs> Grant Ulysses S. Is there is there a version in there where it says who said it? Yeah, Ulysses S. Grant. Oh, often attributed. Oh, often oh, I attributed. Thought was, I thought you said yeah. he did not say. No, it. no, no. It oh, says he, he did. did. Say he okay. says, well, it's attributed to him. He did. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, you know, maybe this you like I can't leave the house. Three. I, I get mad at people when you're they answer angry questions. Person. Like this. You're just very angry. Mm. Let me try that. <laughs> it's like, see what it says like, here. Are you open yet? It's like, well, we usually open at nine thirty. But to, uh, listen, it was a yes or no question, honey. Are you are you open? <laughs> just just yes or no. Just <laughs> you know. Let me just ask. I just it. want to get to the point. Why is Paul Sotherot so angry? <laughs> I do not have enough information about that person to help with your request. I, <laughs> I have this synapse in my brain that's a little too wide, and sometimes the ideas just go right over the edge. The spark jumps. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, given the choice, I would use ChatGPT4. Mm. But uh, Google, I think, is being cautious. They're trying to keep Bard from getting yeah. it in the same... I got it. Well, Trouble you know it. what though? Does cautious is cautious going to win this? Cautious may know. be the wrong play, right? Yeah, now. maybe. No, no. I'm I'm going to disagree right? with you on that, Paul, because I think okay. Microsoft's being the reckless one, and so you're really going to try and yeah. out reckless them, or should you dial it back a bit? Like I said, well, this, yeah, that trough I, of I disillusionment is out there. It's not that far away. Listen, only go one first? can win in a game of chicken. <laughs> yes, <laughs> just saying. It's know. not the cautious one. None can win at a game of chicken, too. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's true. Oh, boy. Yeah, it's what a weird world we, <laughs> we are in right now. Let's try to describe the game of chicken. This is a good <laughs> one. I, well, Let's see if it I gives you describe rules. as a rabbit hole of sorts. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sorry. We can, we can get out of the rat hole and continue on in the chicken game no, two no, players drive just... drive toward each other on a collision course one must swerve or both may die in the crash but if one driver swerves and the other does not the one who swerved will be called a chicken meaning a coward but look at this this is see i like this this game is a model of conflict for two players in game theory the principle of the game is while the ideal outcome is for one player to yield the individuals try to avoid it out of pride for not this wanting to look like a chicken war games I'm and then, very yeah, shall we play a game? It actually uh, cites, yeah. it does do a site, <laughs> Wikipedia. You like a good sighting. Come on. I like the sites. You know, my son and I invented a, a game called Dick Punch, which has similar rules. It's, um, <laughs> there's no winner. Do you have a, a neighbor <laughs> named no Dick? Winner. Is that it? No winners. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no one wins. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> It doesn't last. The very only long. way to win is not to play. <laughs> it's to not play exactly. Ah, oh, well, that my was favorite, our favorite. My favorite story of war games is that after Reagan yep. watched it and he saw the NORAD Center in the in the TV in the movie, he asked to go see yep. the actual NORAD Center, and they didn't have one. It had been invented for the movie, and so he funded them making Now we one. have one. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, well, now, but now it tracks Santa Claus every year, so, um, you know, that was yeah, probably a good obviously. allocation of federal funds. And and every knock looks like NORAD. Like, it's all propagated oh, from a 1980 movie. Oh, my God. That's, That's a wild amazing. story. It's great. OMG. Yeah. And it might, might even be true. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, co you Security. know, as I've yeah. seen some say, I think Ben Thompson said in Stratechery, that the real, the first really good use of, uh, of AI was Copilot, Microsoft's, uh, GitHub feature. GitHub Copilot. The GitHub one, yeah. Which is getting better and better. And now, right. of course, big announcement from a competitor, Repl.it, uh, that they're going to use, uh, Google Compute Platform. 
and uh, and try to do something similar. They have a um, they have a co-pilot like okay. feature called uh, oh I can't remember some Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider. Thank you. Um, so I thought right. that was interesting. I mean, um, is that the really the best use for these kinds of things? The best use? I mean, I, I, I uh, it's a use. I mean, I, I think um, coders are increasingly Microsoft coming has, around on it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would I, I wouldn't mean, disagree with that. It's like you normally before you write a chunk of code, either Google it or Stack Overflow it, and now you're you are yeah. co-piling it because it's probably the same thing. At least you could check to get away from blank screen syndrome. Yeah, and you can I check correctness. So, you can it, no, say what does really, this uh, grep uh, sentence yeah. do and things like that. Yeah, the compiler checks correctness. This um, is this is honestly, I think, the point of AI. Right? We have the the internet gave us all the information in the world. But we need AI to make sense of it, right? Um, uh, geez, I don't know. Two, three years ago when I did the Windows Forms version of my .NET Pad application, I had to figure out how to print. There's not a lot of good information about printing from Windows Forms out there, you know? And what I eventually did was I bought a 2003 book, only on paper. It's never, it was never digitized and made on Kindle or whatever by Charles Petzold about Windows Forms. And he did a thing on printing which still works great. You know, if I could find something like that with AI. Wonderful. Definitive Wonderful. sources. Yep. And, and that's something that, that great. GitHub, GitHub Copilot doesn't worry about things like, is the secure code? Like, that's not a thing. Yeah. It's, is it close sure. to what you described? And it'll, it, it'll well, it's, 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 it's like the thing we just did. did answer the question. I didn't yes. say write secure code that. Yes. <laughs> well, is this, uh, I don't know. Uh, code. I'll, I don't know it well enough, but uh, is this accurate? I asked Bard to write me a Python program that prints from Windows Forms, and it wrote this. Well, that's funny. I don't know what it is. A Python program that writes in it, Windows Forms. Yeah. yeah. To run this program, you'll need to create a new yeah. Windows Forms application in Visual Studio. It's like 800 lines long, so <laughs> I don't know. But. Yeah, what flavor of Python would this be? It might, it might be weird. Iron Python. Yeah. Python, it's, it's the, yeah. Py the mythical Python.net. <laughs> yeah, like, like, you're not wrong. Like there was a version of Iron Python. Jim Huguenin supported it back in the yeah. day be, sure. that ran against the CLR because that's what you need, right? Regular Python doesn't yep. do that. Yeah, to be a, right. If you're yeah. going to have access yeah. to WinForms. Yep. You don't see a lot of WinForms that's not BB or C Sharp. Yeah. <laughs> Let's put it that way. There's some uh, JavaScript. Um, but I, 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 maybe the more important thing that came out of this uh GitHub Copilot is Microsoft got themselves a good brand. Yeah. Right? Copilot is a great brand. A great name. Um, for AI-based functionality of whatever kind. Like, we're going to see Copilot in Windows, Copilot in Office. Yeah. Copilot is going to be... Because the implication is you're still in charge. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to a Those Tesla's autopilot, to right? That's AI Copilot, baby. Yeah. He was carrying you the whole way. <laughs> that was blasphemous anyway the point is <laughs> now they've applied it to security um i'm not sure this is a great use of ai right right now i guess but uh they've released microsoft has released something called security copilot which will leverage ai um to help cybersecurity professionals uh who i guess will query it about their security environment and better understand potential threats the biggest threat of course being uh ai yeah, that's, uh, that's, I, I would argue that most cybersecurity professionals are part-time, and what this tool really does is allow those part-timers to quickly go through all of the current info, mm -hmm. describe the problem space, yeah, and let go. it go through the security mm -hmm. bullets and so forth. It's, again, kind of a fancy search engine, but also tied in with sure. the typical workflows of doing a threat assessment. I wonder uh, how long before like ChatGPT is doing um, red teaming. Yeah. It doesn't have an interface to the outside world, by the way. That's what no. that's what saves hey, us. Hey, ChatGPT just announced a new podcast about Windows. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, guys. But yeah, obviously, you want to give it access to the web and then put it in a red team role because what's a better idea than having it practice hacking? Sure. Sets? Yeah. <laughs> all all is well. Make me some paper clips while you're at it. <laughs> give you one factory but you can use it to make it's hard factories. not to continually reference the terminator movies when yeah. we talk about this stuff 
No, they're they're right there. But again, back to so art, when you say artificial intelligence, you think science fiction. Yeah, that's. Sorry, I think sorry, that's what colors a lot of our reception yeah. for this, mm -hmm. uh, Skynet sure. and all that. Is we're really fiction. yeah we're we we have this preconceived notion of what it is. Mm -hmm. All right, enough of that. Let's get let's get to something that really matters in life. Let's get to the Thank Xbox you. segment. <laughs> yep. All yours, Paul. So, as a, on my I told you so tour 2023, I just want to mention that. I've always kind of said the same thing about Microsoft's ac uh, acquisition of Activision Blizzard, which is that there's no rational excuse not to approve this thing. And uh, we're starting to see it finally kind of happening. So last week, I think it was Florian Mueller who observed at FOSS Patents that uh, the language around these discussions has turned from what do we have to do to stop this to, okay, what's the exact language we're, we're going to use to accept this? Um, the UK, UK CDMA, which was one of the big three that opposed this, now says they were wrong, that there there will be no harm to the video game industry if Microsoft acquires this company, uh, and they will likely be approving it. Didn't they say they might uh, uh, investigate hand. Sony as well? Like, oh, and by they the should. way, thank you. now we're going to go after Sony. Yeah. Yeah, good. Because <laughs> that's what needs to happen here. Uh, Japan, their FTC, approved it without any conditions whatsoever. Just remind everyone, Japan, Sony's home country. Right. <laughs> so interesting. And then uh, Activision, uh, Activision CEO, uh, who I think we can all agree is one of the greatest people in the world and just a super nice guy. E uh, Little Bobby Kotick. <laughs> Bobby Kotick. <laughs> but he did come out and say publicly um, something which we all, uh, you know, I, it's obvious, but, it, but he's saying it publicly, which I think is interesting, which is that Sony's behavior is disappointing. These guys have been partners for 30 years. Um, we're not going to allow this to affect our long-term relationship. But the notion, which Sony, you know, Sony, as they get more and more desperate and is trying to come up with reasons why this shouldn't happen, you know, had said recently, well, what if Microsoft deliberately makes the version of Call of Duty worse on PlayStation, right? Because they'll introduce bugs and they'll, you know, they'll make people go to Xbox. And it's like, guys, Microsoft doesn't really actually make money if you buy an Xbox, you know? They make a lot of money if you buy their software. Uh, they don't care where that is. That's the whole Satya Nadella thing. Meet people where they are, right? Um, it doesn't make sense for Microsoft to take Call of Duty off of PlayStation. It also doesn't make sense for Microsoft, purposefully or not, to make Call of Duty not work as well on PlayStation. Uh, to, for it to be buggy, like deliberately buggy, is insane. Um, so it's interesting that this guy, who again, not, not a great guy by any stretch of the imagination, but... Uh, and will be gone as soon as his acquisition is uh, finalized. Had to come out and say basically like this: is like we don't understand what they're doing. We don't agree with it. They're wrong. And uh, when this is over, Call you know Call of Duty will just keep working on PlayStation like it always has. So don't worry about it. You know, there's also um, an era of we're still trying to. We still want Sony as a partner. Like no yeah, hard feelings because you're losing. Yeah, no hard feelings. Although I, there are hard feelings. I. Let's, let's be clear. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sometime in the past year, I think it was last year, Microsoft released something called the Elite Series 2 core controller. This is a less expensive version of their expensive controller with all the removable bits where you can replace the paddles and all that stuff. Um, it doesn't have as, as many removable bits, but one of the things that's interesting about it, one of the many things, is that this one has been customizable, right? So I think you can go into their uh, Xbox controller customization service and use you know, create a Series 2 core controller if you want to, but it's also allowed Microsoft to come out with many more versions of this version of the controller, color versions, right? So where the original Elite controller was just black, this one, you know, immediately they had black and white, now they have all these color versions. So they just announced uh, red and blue versions, which I normally, it's like, who cares, red and blue? But if you're a long-term Xbox, uh, Xbox person, you know that red versus blue is kind of a big thing. This is 20 years ago. Um, this was a series of uh, kind of viral videos that Microsoft did based around the Halo games. Um, so I have to think, I have to hope, I have to believe, because I'm an Xbox guy, that that is not coincidental. And that uh, if you're an X versus, or a red versus blue kind of a guy, you will get a kick out of that and enjoy it. Um, also, I think Wasn't ever the original since there's red been an versus Xbox blue, Game Pass. I think the original red versus mm -hmm. blue is actually like a Rooster Teeth, like YouTube series 
that Microsoft then okay. hijacked for good PR. Yeah, but they kind of co-opted. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Well, I this was like the I original. Like, yeah, um, that was Rooster Teeth. Yeah, that Microsoft yeah. co-opted. Yeah, it. they were they were very comedic. Yeah, they yeah. They, yeah. they they they, yeah. they used it for a few promotions. That like I think at one point Scott Guthrie was blue. Was oh the blue, man, right? like, of course it, he was. It, it was it was funny in the cringe way. It was blue goo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, blue goo. Probably so Rooster the, the, Teeth was the just the happy they weren't getting red sued. Blue. So if you Google Red versus Blue and Halo, what you'll it, one of the questions is: Is Halo canon to Red versus Blue? And the joke is that Red versus Blue is canon, and the rest of the Halo universe is just a spinoff. <laughs> that makes, that <laughs> makes just, perfect sense. Yes, it's just, I think that's pretty true. Good. Yes, pretty good. But you can go to Halo Waypoint that they discuss this like it's it's a like what is this thing? And it's like okay, here's the history of it. You know, it's anyway. There are red and blue controllers. That's all I'm saying. Um, uh, since the beginning of Xbox Game Pass, and now there, of course, there are three versions of it. Uh, Microsoft has offered a one dollar uh, for the first month kind of intro offer for new customers. Uh, they are doing away with that. And um, why would that be? I'm guessing that people are just starting up free Microsoft accounts and doing a one dollar trial. And what they've discovered is that there were entire IPS uh, IP ranges that are just doing this. I mean, that's my guess. But anyway, you can no longer do that so I this is why we stuff. can't have nice things yeah i'm kind of surprised exactly. they even thought it was a good idea in the first place but i've taken advantage of it um yeah more times than i should more than once to. um but uh. yeah it's a th well you know i i had to write the chapter of the book where that dealt with this i'm like i'm not going to pay 10 bucks or 15 bucks for this but there's a one dollar okay anyway <laughs> uh i'm not i didn't do anything wrong why am i on trial here the point is they're going to okay <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> if you've been kind of following along with the the greener new Microsoft, you know they have that little icon. Let me go look at it in uh, Windows Update that says Windows Update is committed to helping reduce carbon emissions. <laughs> All of the hot air is coming out of our PR department now. Uh, um, they've how been doing can, how can uh, similar they do things that? obviously in the do? Xbox consoles. Oh, Leo, don't make me look. <laughs> it's just the way they deliver up. It's just so, it's so pointless. Okay. Um, there's a new power ma management mode in the Xbox consoles that, you know, will, you know, single-handedly save the environment. I always turn all that stuff off because it just melting. slows everything down. I don't. Yeah, yeah, because you want it to turn on in time, you mean? Yeah, yeah. sure. No, I, I know. I know. I don't get it. But here's an idea. If you are going to make a tank, don't worry about its fuel efficiency. <laughs> like this is the point of this thing. It's supposed to be a beast. Anyway, um, they just released an Xbox developer sustainability toolkit, which among other things helps developers to take power consumption into account in their game development process. The idea here is that, you know, we're playing games over the internet and perhaps they can do things that will decrease energy usage because dear God, I don't even know what we're talking about anymore, but this is what we're doing. So there you go. You ever drive behind a someone in a Prius who is, just kind of kicking ass and driving really fast. No, because that's what those people do. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like Xbox users are not interested in, I don't know. I don't get it, but whatever. I know. I race the Prius and Forza all the time. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> right. I feel like, do, do Priuses actually come with a student driver bumper sticker that's permanent? Is that like a... <laughs> Every Pierce is that just like it's a that or standard taxi, part of the right or Uber yeah. like that's right. what you get. I don't know. If I, yeah, geez, Louise, guys. I mean, if I wanted a Nintendo, I'd get a Nintendo. Anyway, sorry. So, uh, and then finally, uh, not a huge, huge deal, but Steam announced uh, that they will drop support for Windows Seven and Eight Point X sometime in 2024. Uh, so over a year, it's probably going to be. I think it's July 2024 or later. So that would be the earliest date. Uh, I th nope. I'm sorry, I'm wrong. It's January, not July. January first, 2024. Um, those versions of Windows are unsupported, right? As of this past January, so I guess they're giving them an additional year. Although, I think there was talk of it might be longer than a year, but it will be at least a year. So, uh, could be next January. And I actually is there data for Didn't how many say people? It's like down on... to a, it's like the, just a couple of percentage points left. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Yeah, 1.52% yeah. are still using Windows 7. So there you go. That's actually kind of interesting. And 0.34% are using uh, Windows 8.1. Um, why does Steam care? When I saw the story, I saw OS you're running. back in my brain. Yeah, I mean, why What's does that? Steam care? They, they, why does Steam care that they're running? What, what operating system you're running? 
Well, because not uh, all games uh, work on all operating systems. So I can right. only, you know, I can't play uh, Call of Duty on the a relentless Mac. march of progress. Well, the, for all of the work done to make Windows more efficient in recent years, I do sort of in the back of my brain wonder if you brought up a basic Windows 7 installation, put one game on that system, would that thing run, you know, faster, whatever, faster? Right. And uh, I bet it would, <laughs> actually. Yeah, but I wonder, other I wonder than the fact if, uh, that. I wonder if Steam is requiring Direct versions and yeah, they so they require support to be to be profiled high. Yeah, in there's the, other in stuff the going. It's not just the yeah. right. It's not so this is the game stuff. developers pressing on Steam saying lift that requirement because it makes it easier for us to make the game. Yeah, but if I you're playing a, a modern game, I, you want the latest DirectX. You want the latest yeah, you know, video card that would only be supported on you know modern Windows versions, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah. So next, Steam announces three ninety or better, right? Like. <laughs> if you haven't dropped a grand on but a video if you card, save you energy, don't get to play. I'll tell you, there get you an go. Xbox, baby. You certainly it's, can turn you off your furnace. It's, it's like a carbon offset every time you turn it on. It's amazing. <laughs> I believe it squirts a little bit of fresh air into the room too. It's nice. <laughs> I don't know what the hell we're talking about. What is this? I thing? don't know what happened to this show. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying to kill go. aliens here. I don't, I'm not know. Trying to, I don't know. I'm going to hey. save the earth a different way. <laughs> Let's. Am I don't, missing something? Uh, <laughs> I, I want an Xbox it. made out of wood. Okay, renewable yeah. wood, not right. bamboo. Jeez. Maybe I, I want my lights to dim when I turn this thing on. Well, what are you they, they about? do actually, but that's another mm. story for another day. Let us yeah. take a break. Back of the book coming up, which means a tip of the week, an app of the week, and a brown liquor of the week. Plus. <laughs> I think we have time for the story of distilling. <laughs> but first. <laughs> yes, right. Distilling, part one of seven. No, I'm, It was I, the best of times. I'm just teasing. <laughs> uh, it was the distilling of times. The distilling of times. It's time for a word from our sponsor, the studio sponsor. That's a big deal. The AC on learning folks, if we've got signage all over, uh, we are thrilled to have them as a as a kind of flagship sponsor of our network. And you might say, well, who are ACI Learning when they're at home? Well, I think you know the name IT Pro. They've been talking about IT Pro for, well, since they started, um, I think it's 10 years ago now. Uh, IT Pro is now part of ACI Learning. Together, they're they're expanding their production capabilities. They're bringing you the, the content you need uh, and you can learn it any way you want, remote, hybrid, on-prem. You They actually have uh, hubs where you can go with a teacher, instructor, and other students. Whatever works for you, whether you want individual training for yourself or you want to train your whole team, ACI Learning and IT Pro have you covered. Uh, I know a lot of you, because you're interested in IT and you want to get a job in IT, They, they you went to IT Pro. Still the best place to learn access to 6,800 hours of content, always up to date. There's new content added every single day. You can get team training from uh, IT Pro, uh, a from ACI Learning. You can get team training for CompTIA, Microsoft IT, Cisco, Linux, Apple, Security, Cloud, and on and on and on. One of the most widely known and widely recognized beginner certificates is the CompTIA A Plus cert. So many people getting into IT start with the A Plus. It, courses from IT Pro and ACI Learning make it easy to level up your employees who have vested interests in cybersecurity. Some really great cybersecurity certs, CISSP, AWS, ISACA, CCNA, technical support specialist, computer user support specialist, information security analyst. Basically, they've got it all. Any in-demand tech skill, any cert, Get it from IT Pro and ACI Learning. And the reason certs are so important, of course, if you're, you know, you've never worked in IT, it shows you have the basic knowledge, that A-plus cert, for instance. But it also shows you had the determination to go to study, to take the test, and to pass it, you know. Uh, it lets your customers, it lets your future employer know you're committed. And when you're a business giving a training to your staff, your IT staff, it shows your, your, your customers, your suppliers, your partners that you're committed to keeping your organization up to date. 
And ACI Learning and IT Pro are with you every step of the way. With an IT Pro business plan, ACI Learning offers fully customizable training for your team. They've got that great dashboard that lets you track everything. Manage seats, assign and unassigned team members, access monthly usage reports so you can see if, you know, if you're getting your money's worth. You've got metrics like logins, viewing time, tracks completed. You can manage subsets of users. You can say, you three take this course. You should be looking at this episode of this course, that kind of thing. Completely customize the assignments, monitor the progress reporting on the usage of the platform. You get full access to all this advanced reporting, including very visual reports, which are helpful in justifying the spend to the higher ups, to the board. You know, you can say, look what we're doing. And to your and you know what? To your partners too, right? Respected companies and government agencies around the globe turn to IT Pro and ACI Learning year after year to help them maintain their competitive edge, supporting organizations across audit, IT, and cybersecurity readiness. ACI Learning keeps you and your team at the top of their game. From entry-level training to putting people on the moon, ACI Learning has you covered. Maintain your company's competitive edge with ACI Learning by visiting the website, go.acilearning.com slash twit. Go.acilearning.com slash twit. And for those of you looking to start today with a standard or premium individual IT Pro membership, use the offer code twit30, twit30, and you'll get 30% off. Shh, do it. Don't, it's a secret. Twit, well, it's not a secret. Every Tell everybody, <laughs> twit30 for 30% off. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. We're big fans. We always have been of IT Pro. Go.acilearning.com slash twit. The offer code is twit30. Now, let's go to the back of the book. What are you laughing at? I just discard it. Just, <laughs> it's just, is uh, it Nicholas Cage? Is that what I'm seeing? Nicholas oh, it's it's after you squirt a little fresh in air into the room from your Xbox. <laughs> Nicholas, just, uh, Nicholas is really enjoying into it. The, <laughs> the exhaust port of the Xbox, enjoying <laughs> it right there. <laughs> yeah, our, like our Discordians really uh, have a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that is the uh, the Discord chat room that is for members of Club Twit <laughs> and apparently fans of Nicolas Cage. Uh, On air. <laughs> and his hair. Uh, uh, if you are not yet a member of Club Twit, I do want to encourage you to, to join because that seven bucks a month uh, Twit Club members give us really helps us put new shows on the air like Paul's Hands on Windows. Uh, we got Hands on Macintosh with Micah. We've got uh, a Linux show. We've got all sorts of stuff. That the club members pay for, uh, and th and that really is important to us because we always want to add new stuff. We just uh, brought Scott Wilkinson back with Home Theater Geeks, thanks to the club. It's a club only right now. Maybe someday, like this week in space, it'll grow up to be a a full fledged podcast. Um, there's also corporate memberships. If you're not yet a member of Club Twit and you'd like to support what we do, if you enjoy what we do. I think seven bucks a month, it's a it's a fair price for what you get. You get access to the Discord, which is full of great stuff. You get that special Twit Plus free feed. Oh, I didn't even mention, you get ad-free versions of all the shows. You won't even hear this. I'll never have to beg you again. Go to twit.tv slash club twit, and thanks in advance. All right, Paul, it's all you, baby. Tip of the week time. So uh, we just I just mentioned uh, Windows 7 and 8X support on Steam. Firefox just I mean, this I think I was confusing uh, Mozilla and, and Valve, I guess. Uh, Firefox just announced that they will support Windows 7 and 8X until at least uh, Q3 2024. Good for them. Um, Even though Microsoft is not. Yes, yeah, so you can use Firefox. Right. Um, better idea? I don't know. Maybe upgrade your operating system. Um, <laughs> Firefox is fine. I I could think of all kinds of good reasons to use it. Um, Got to love a little gecko. But, uh, Honestly, I yeah, think that's one of the main things that pushes people to upgrading their operating system is that the browser stops working. Browser, yeah, yeah. And once the yeah. browser stops working, you know, it's a lot you can't do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I don't remember off the top of my head what Google's deal with Chrome is, but I believe it's already not supported or will soon not be supported. Something like that. So yeah. Anyway, but if you are stuck on it for whatever reason, I. 
you know, uh, stop it, you know, putting something between you and the most obvious vector for getting malware in your computer isn't such a horrible idea. Uh, a better idea is, like I said, upgrading. Um, our friend uh, Michael Niehaus, uh, who I know, Rich, I think I just listened to an episode. Just of did a show with him, yeah. Run as radio with Michael, mm-hmm. yeah. Has released an alternative to Microsoft's media creation tool, right? So today there are two versions of the tool, one for Windows 11, one for Windows 10. And uh, they don't, they only support x86 uh, or x64, depending on the version. Um, so he has created a single tool that does both versions of the OS and supports all versions of those versions of the OSs, meaning it also supports ARM64. Um, there's a whole thing going on. Uh, you know, people are kind of into this stuff. Like if you want to, if you said, for example, like, hey, I need to get an ISO to install Windows 11 on ARM or whatever. Well, that's not available publicly. How do I do that? Um, there are places you can download those things out on the web. There are these things called ESD, which are kind of like um, highly compressed versions of WIM files, which is what we use to create these things on the back end that uh, like um, enterprises use to customize a Windows install, for example. Um, and ESD is a, is not easy to customize because it's so compressed, but it's the type of thing you can ship over the internet a little bit more easily. And uh, Microsoft makes those available for all of these systems. So I guess he's gathered together all this stuff and made a tool. Um, I will say... Uh, I installed this. I, well, it's, you just run it, really. You just download it and run it. Um, it was flagged as a some kind of malware by a smart screen or whatever in Windows, um, but it's from Michael, so we know it's okay. Um, so if you see that and you're worried about it, just know that uh, there's nothing malicious going on here. He's a good guy. Yeah, he's um, one of the best, without a doubt. And yeah, this is the thing Microsoft should have made. And he still... <laughs> and may, yes, is they this, do have a rich history. Is this better than Rufus or... Which you've been recommending. It's, well, it's actually, kind of so same. you still have to use Rufus uh, oh, okay. combined. with What this will do is get you the image file, the yeah, ISO. The oh, ISO you need. So in this case, okay. you would still, yeah, you would then use Rufus to create the actual, bo- if you need a bootable USB, you would still use Rufus. Right, got it. Got it, got it, got it. But this, like I said, this is particularly interesting because you can get your ARM64 ISO for I Windows see. 10 or Windows yes. 11. And multiple languages, mm. right? Nice. So, yeah, very, very nice. Okay. Good stuff. This is a good idea. It's a really yeah. good idea. You know what so else should... is a good idea? Run as radio. Mm-hmm. And uh-huh. I'm wondering, Mr. Richard Campbell. I'm going to go get some whiskey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> get ready. <laughs> I, I will drink it responsibly. I'm not an idiot. <laughs> uh, what, when does multi-cloud make sense, Richard? When? When? Well, this is a conversation I had with Fumala Schmidt uh, a little while ago, published today, actually. And we, we mostly defined some terms first. The, the point being, and this is a Gartner term, most enterprises are poly-cloud. That is, they use more than one cloud provider. So if you're on Salesforce, plus you use Azure, maybe one department's got some stuff in AWS, like that's sort of reality for most big organizations. So many organizations are poly-cloud. And so we separated that from multi-cloud being, I have a given workload, I want to run on more than one cloud, typically for redundancy sake, that I believe I need to be more reliable than any given cloud provider. And those are... I mean, I'm not saying they don't happen. They're pretty rare cases. And the sacrifices you need to make to actually build software that will operate between clouds effectively are substantial. You know, certain technologies, and Kubernetes is certainly one of them, are available on-prem and on all the clouds. And so there is the ability to shift workloads there well. But you have to use the very generic version of those features. You don't want to get in the cloud-specific stacks because that's not going to be portable to the other cloud options. Now, that that's where that conversation went, was really digging into what's our way to look across clouds to try and build stuff that would run up between them. Azure Arc came up because it is a tool that is larger than any given cloud. It certainly works well with Azure, but it also works on-prem and in the other cloud providers. So that is an approach to to helping to manage that problem. But I really wanted to get in on this. Hey, you know, often you have senior leadership that says, well, clouds go down. Like, how are we going to stay up no matter what? And my usual reaction to that was to draw it on a whiteboard just how much that's going to cost. And then suddenly that little ad- that that expense for that rare event, you, you know, oh, ends the conversation. And, and but if you want to do it, it's doable. It's just hard, and I think rarely needed. 
What does multi-cloud, when does multi-cloud make sense with Fumala Schmidt? Run is radio 873. Mm -hmm. Cool. Run is radio .com. Yeah. And now we've been waiting for your explanation. Part seven. Yeah. How I mean, is that, liquor made? That. It's not that many parts. I'm like a, like, I'm like a puppy waiting for it, something to fall off the table. Uh, I mean, I'm, honest to goodness, <laughs> you know? I spend more time writing this. I mean, we, we go all the way back. We appreciate to, we, it. Thank you. Yeah. We talked about growing barley and then malting the barley and then milling the barley, then making the mash, which was, you know, now we, we start, we extract the sugars from the, our malted barley ferment it now the the in comes the alcohol part of the equation and that gives us our wort which we've now shipped over into our washbacks and we have a seven percent you know you can filter it and make it make pot beer from it i don't recommend it you know hops helps but uh you're now ready to start to distill and distilling is an ancient craft we have plenty of evidence to show that humans figured out that you could take liquid compounds and separate them into their constituents parts with heat the earliest types of documented skills the alembic skills go back to greek times uh and they were typically you had a, a pot with the, with the, which they called a kirkabit that would heat up the, the fluid and they did make alcohol this way back you know several thousand years ago uh, up into a head where the vapors uh, collect and then they go down a tube that slopes into a receiver container of some kind and you cool it down and you get uh, some kind of distillate. Okay, those are sort of the generic terms. Now the, the liquid we're particularly interested in this case is ethanol and ethanol boils at 78 degrees centigrade. That's 165 Fahrenheit versus water, which is, you know, 100 degrees, 212. So you can heat this mixture of liquid just enough to have the alcohol lift out without lifting the water out. And now we get into various kinds of stills. So the Alembic stills are sort of ancient stills, and some of them are still used. Typically the Armagnac process, that early low alcohol level, they typically only distill up to 40 or so percent to make these early brandies out of old wine, um, still use Alembic stills. They're very simple. Um, the advanced still, the fancy still today, and I mentioned these in last week's show, the column stills, like the coffee still, are for continuous distillation. You know, pot stills are batch. You load them, you distill for a certain period of time, typically five, six hours, and then you have to clean them out and start over. Column stills are continuous. So you are literally feeding feedstock into it all the time. It's actually two separate columns, one called the analyzer, one called the rectifier, because 19th century names are the best. And they use steam to, to heat. Uh, steam is actually added into the bottom of the, of the analyzer with the wash coming down from the top through a series of plates. And the heat's applied and, and the alcohol starts to evaporate, goes out the top into the, into the rectifier where it's condensed and filtered out. Um, column stills are the modern way. They're often made of stainless steel and uh, are quite a bit fancier. That's where you can get into like making neutral spirits or uh, a, a high rectified spirits, 95% alcohol plus. Uh, it, um, when you're trying to talk about whiskey, you, you rarely want to, you don't want to distill that high because it takes all the flavors out. We talk about things like cogenitors and ester ether uh, uh, and um, polyethyl uh, esters that are flavor that come from the grain. And so you want to distill a little lower. So in the case of, uh, whiskey, they use pot stills. And that picture you showed up was a collection of pot stills. Uh, this is basically the modern version of the Alembic stills, all batch-based. Specifically for barley-based whiskeys, most of all, pot stills are copper. And the reason is that there's a certain amount of sulfur that exists within barley. It's a normal part of the plant. And those uh, sulfurous compounds, when distilled, can get quite foul. And copper reacts with sulfur to be able to remove it as copper sulfates. You want a certain amount, but you I don't want didn't too much. That. I thought it was so, because it, it was so conductive for the cooling, but it's actually well, that's a chemical. A, that's a, it's, there's a chemical part and there is certainly the conduction part. Like that's How important. And that, that picture of the pot still you have there. So the lower part is called the pot 
And then you have sort of a shoulder region that goes up into the swan neck and ultimately onto the lye arm. Now, the stru these structures vary from pot still to pot still, and each distillery has very specific designs. Uh, and the part, part of this is that as the condensate comes up in the still and gets into that swan neck, it does land on the copper and cools and will tend to fall back down. They call it reflux. And it takes a certain amount of cycles of reflux to remove mo the, co the, co the sulfur to the level that you're happy with. Um, sometimes these stills will have a bulge above that pot they call the OG. And that is, again, giving more surface area for reflux. The shape of the swan neck, how tall it goes, whether it curves or not, all specific to a given distillery. The lie arm coming out. Here you, know, here you see them coming out horizontally. Some of them tilt up. Some of them tilt down. Very, very stylized and, and all part of the flavor of the white spirit they're going to generate in the end. Now, after, wow. after you come out of the lye arm, then you're going into a condenser. So now you're trying to consolidate those, uh, those, those distilled alcohols. And you can see that coil set sitting there is probably from a worm tub. So that would be sitting in a big tub, wooden tub full of cold water. The distillate would condense out of that uh, through those coils, and that would give you your initial distillation. Mm. Now, Scottish distillation is almost always a double distillation process. So you're going to start with uh, a first distillation. It'll take that 7-8% uh, initial wart and then uh, take it up to around 20 to 30% uh, ABV. Uh, there's a bunch of challenges to this. So the these first stills, or what they call the wash stills, are larger. They're the bigger of the stills. The spirit stills will tend to be smaller. And the wash stills have uh, windows in them. They call them sight glasses to watch for foaming. Uh, how you heat the still matters a lot. Uh, in traditional stills, they were heated directly. There was heat underneath the still. Now, there's a couple of problems with that. One is that tends to get very hot. And it can burn the wash in the process. And so sometimes you want those Maillard effects. Some, stills pref some distilleries prefer that effect because they get some toasted notes into it. Um, but you have to manage that very carefully. It's also an explosion hazard. You are ah, making right. alcohol gas. Yikes. And should it leak from the chamber, you can blow the building to pieces. <laughs> Um, oh you know, there's a reason why this is a regulated industry. And so most modern Scottish distillers today use steam. So the boiler is in a separate building where the yeah. fire is yeah. and they pipe the steam to the stills to heat them up well, far safer. Um, you showed a, for a moment there a mechanical structure inside of a still. That's a stir, and it's for direct heated stills to keep the mash moving or the wash moving around so that it doesn't burn. Uh, but if you're using steam where you only get to 200 to 300 degrees at most, remember, you're only trying to get to 78 Celsius, just enough heat to be able to evaporate the alcohol off. You don't need to, to go that high. So uh, uh, your distiller is a very active process. The distiller is involved in here. As the, as the mash initially starts to heat up, it's going to foam at first. You don't want that foam going up into the lye neck and getting into the distillate. It's, it's a contaminant. So you'll be heating slowly and watching the foam level through the sight glasses. And eventually, as the still heats up as a whole and the mash is to temperature, the foam will die down. And then you can get running to get to temperature to start to get alcohol extracted from it. Now, that's the first wash. That's the, the, the first distillation, the wash distillation. And it's going to flow into a holding tank, which they call the low wines tank. And low wines is that 20 to 30% alcohol initial distillate. Now you're going to go into your spirit stills. Very typically same design. They're also copper. They tend to be smaller because you have less liquid involved. Uh, there's fewer solids, so you don't need sight glasses and so forth. There's no foaming risk here. But now you're going to heat it up again, and it's going to have that reflux effect. It's going to go up into the swan neck and fall back down. There's going to be a couple of cycles. This is another distillation where the, the wash distillation probably runs four to six hours. The second distillation, six to eight hours. And you're going much higher. And that those fluids are going to go down into the spirit safe, also well. known as the intermediate 
spirit receiver. Now, this is a <laughs> locked cabinet with clear the glass on container. it. Because now we have to talk about taxes. Oh. Mm -hmm. So when you're, ma you know, back in the day, you're just making spirits for yourself and maybe selling them. So, of course, the tax man wanted a cut of this. And so lots of smuggling involved. And so... Uh, the excised uh, the excise tax of 1823 is when they came up with this thing called the spirit safe model and those locks are controlled by the tax man by the excise officers to control access to it and so the distiller actually has to operate the still with remote controls through this so there's actually this particular one you've got on the screen right now he's got three different points so the left side would actually be the low wine distillations that comes out of the first uh wa the wash still and then they are basically watching for clarity so it's going down into what's called the feints tank which is the stuff they're not going to use they'll probably use it for a second distillation later on until it runs clear and then it'll be pointed they'll turn it turn a little knob and aim that spout into the low wines tank and then as it gets later in the distillation particulate will start to appear again and they'll steer it away when we get into the spirit distillation, that's that center point, and they're watching for the alcohol level. So we know that ethanol evaporates at 78 degrees centigrade, but there are other compounds that evaporate at lower temperatures, including methanol, the stuff that makes you go blind, and acetyl hydrates and ethyl esters. And so those typically show up in the very beginning of any high distillation and the alcohol level is substantially higher. So you measure the alcohol level. And if you're running in the 70 to 70, uh, 78, 80%, that's part of the head. You don't want that. And so you'll steer that back into the faints tank. As after the head comes the heart, this is the stuff they call new make, the, the, the distillate you want. And that's around 71, 72%, depending on the distillery. And they'll put that into the, um, uh, in, in, into the intermediate receiver. So that's the stuff they're going to la later barrel. Later in the run, hours later, the alcohol level begins to decline. It gets down below 70%, 68 65%. And that's when you start to get these heavy, oilier compounds that have very strong flavors, and they'll tend to steer that, all again, over to the faints receiver. Um, again, in Scottish tradition, nothing is wasted, so everything that ends up in the faints receiver will typically be put back into the wash still to add to the next run. Um, but won't be part of that uh, that new make. So your all that stuff gets shifted off to the other side, all controlled remotely through these safes. I would point out that today the distilleries have the keys. Not that whiskey isn't taxed; it is. It's just taxed at bottling now, not taxed at distillation. And remember, all of this is a clear spirit, right? All the color we're going to get. It's going to come from the wood in the next phase. But now I get to tell the story of why I selected the Dalmore for our whiskey this week. So I take a tour of the distillery uh, at the Dalmore. And they have their two, two, their two original wash stills are massive. They're 16,500 liters. Now that's what, 360, 3,600 imperial gallons, about 4,400 U.S. gallons, because why wouldn't you have different measures for gallons? Like, what the hell is wrong with gallons in the first place? Did the U.S. pick a different gallon just because it was different from the U.K.? Nah, not that simple. The U.S. gallon is actually based on the Queen Anne gallon, which is an English gallon based for on wine. Wine gallons were Queen Anne gallons. At that time, they also had grain gallons. And they had beer gallons, which are different sizes. Because oh, why Lord. wouldn't you mean three different <laughs> oh sizes, God. all the same name? <laughs> and who wants a and gallon so, of wine anyway? <laughs> yeah, and so eventually, uh, the, eventually the UK consolidated on the Imperial gallon, which was 160 ounces versus the Queen Anne gallon, which is 128 ounces. Ounces being a measurement of weight or a measurement of volume. Hey, why not both? Because reasons, right? And this is where we get to the whole point about the metric system, right? The French Revolution, like... Come on, mon dieu, you're still beheading your nobles with an axe? Why, when would you ever stop and have wine and baguette, right? It's the, <laughs> it's the French Revolution. Presente de la guillotine. Now you can behead a dozen, dozen nobles per hour. Much more time, way more efficient, and you can retire by 62, or is it 64? Or revolution. <laughs> Nobody knows. But listen, Cherie, forget about the feet, the pounds, the ounces, the gallons. 
a 10 centimeter cube holds one liter of water, which weighs one kilogram. It's just so, so simple. simple. So simple. So in 1874 at the Dalmore, they got bought these at the time massive 16,500 liter stills and they didn't fit in the building. <laughs> the building wasn't big enough for them. And so they cut the swan necks off. Oh my to God. get them into the building and then put a cap on it and attach the liar arm below the cap, making a completely different looking still. And when they ran them, they like them. Uh. And so to this day, now later they bought another set of wash stills that fit in their building better. So they actually use both sets to combine to make their distinct version of whiskey. They're big on sherry casking and their fundamental, the one I recommend anyone start with if you want to experiment with the Dalmore, is the Dalmore 12. It's about $65 US. It's got a deep red rich color. Um, the 15, the 18, and so on up the line get more expensive and all have their own unique natures to them. A lot of that has to do with barreling, but there's nothing quite like the wash stills of the Dalmore. And once you know all the story of that, then when you look at a still, you're like, what's up with that still? Uh, and the fact that it didn't fit in the building in 1874 <laughs> is how that came about. I love it. And I love the metal uh, deer on the front of the Dalmore. Yeah. The stag. The stag. That yes. is awesome. The famous, famous stag. So the Dalmore 12 is our recommendation this time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to run out to my liquor barn and find one right now. <laughs> Drink the whole thing a metric gallon of, uh, <laughs> of is that an imperial gallon or a u.s gallon nobody knows it's all confusing all right. you know Holy what i try cow. 750 milliliters yeah. it's a nice measurement it's, it's very precise it's easy it's very simple it's, it's three quarters of a kilo it makes total sense and so we're now at the point where we have about a 70 to 73 percent clear distillate white spirit ready for barreling and that's what we'll talk about next week. Sounds great. All this talk makes me thirsty. But I guess that's the point. Uh, we do have from Joe Esposito a suggestion for the title of this show and a poster. 12 <laughs> Angry Pauls yep. starring Paul, 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 and Paul. Uh, very nice, oh, Joe. That's awesome. And a partridge in a pear I tree. Think Joe spends that's the entire show word. working in Photoshop. It's kind of like knitting while you... Yep. Uh, Watch people's heads being chopped off, but it's not quite the same. I love that. I it's like so how brilliant. he made it. The illustration look like you. That's yeah, mm -hmm. I know it's crazy. Great. So this was like Twelve Angry Men, right? Yeah, I think it's the poster of Twelve Angry Men, slightly <laughs> modified. <laughs> I love. I it. can't stand there being one of me. I, I <laughs> can only imagine. Oh, you know the Pauls. best part about Twelve Pauls? Bounty. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, clean up this mess. we have concluded the show, and I'm glad you were here for it. Another great episode of Windows Weekly. You'll find Richard Campbell at runasradio.com. That's also where .NET Rock lives. Uh, Paul Therott is at therott.com. That's his blog. He also has, of course, the field guide of Windows 11 and the brand new Windows Everywhere, which is kind of a history of Microsoft Windows as seen through its programming and programming languages. And both are at leanpub.com. Check them out. Check them out. Uh, well worth reading in both cases. Uh, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Richard. We do the show uh, Wednesdays, or as I like to call it, Taco Tuesday Part 2, uh, every Wednesday, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. I stole that joke, but it's a good one. 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Pacific Time. Uh, that would be about 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. That would be, I don't know, you figure it out. 1800 UTC, it all begins. Uh, and the live stream is live.twit.tv, audio or video, you choose. If you're watching live, chat live in our IRC, open to all, that's irc.twit.tv. And, of course, club members get their private club where Dalmore is served exclusively. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> at twit.tv slash club. Not true. Sorry. No, not true. It's up to you what you want to serve. That's all I can say. Um, we also have on-demand uh, versions at the website, twit.tv slash www. Uh, YouTube also uh, has a channel dedicated to Windows Weekly. The ultimate on-demand, of course, is subscribing your favorite podcast player. That way you've just got it sitting on your phone whenever you need it, and you can listen to it on, uh, at your leisure, whenever you need a hit. 
Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Richard. Have a great uh, couple of weeks. I'm going to be gone uh, oh, next week right. and the week after and the week right, after right, that. Right. I'm uh, going on vacation. What? <laughs> no, it's How shocking. dare you? How dare I? What? What is this vacation you speak of? You guys work when you leave town, but I... You told, you said, oh, this is the cruise. You're going to Mediterranean. Yeah, we're going to see if I can... So I look forward to seeing those photos. COVID part two, since the last time you and I and Richard went on a cruise. No, no, Europe's good. We kind of... We'll be fine. We can I mean, what are the chances of that happening again? <laughs> what a cow. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy talk. I will be back um, on the uh, 26th. Who is going to... Who's going to fill in, you might be wondering. Yeah. So am I. I am wondering. I don't know. Okay. We talked about it. I've promptly forgot. Uh, I suspect yeah. uh, Micah Sargent will come by sometimes. Maybe Aunt Pruitt. Mm -hmm. Other times, maybe Jason Howell. Okay. It'll be one of those three. Maybe all three, because I'll be gone for three weeks. I like all those guys. That's yeah. all good. It'll all That's be all good, good people. You know, they'll let you do your thing, and uh, they'll do the <laughs> ads. That's That makes it easy. You're going to miss the barreling. Ah, damn it. You know, I could still hear the show. I, I have a whole yeah. bit on Glenn, Glenn Farkless because I find a 1956 show, edition. Have I like Glenn Farkless. I like <laughs> Glenn Farkless. Uh, so does Mrs. Farkless, by the way. Uh, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful month. I'll see you late in April, mm -hmm. you too. And uh, uh, the rest of you, come back here next Wednesday for another Windows Weekly. Bye-bye. Hey there, I'm Micah Sargent from Twit, and uh, you may be asking a question. What in the world do you do if you want to thank that hard-working team of yours? Well, why not gift them a Club Twit corporate subscription? Oh, and here's a secret. You'll be benefiting yourself, too, because you will be able to keep your team informed and entertained with podcasts covering the latest in tech. So they'll always stay up to date. With a Club Twit subscription, they're going to get access to all of our podcasts ad free. They'll get access to the members only Discord server where they can chat with fellow Club Twit members and all of us here at Twit and exclusive shows like Hands on Mac, Hands on Windows and the Untitled Linux show. Go to twit.tv slash Club Twit and look for corporate plans for complete details.